Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our regularly scheduled uh, uh, council meeting for February the 27th. Um, as we call the meeting to order, we just like to acknowledge that we're gathering on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen people, uh, specifically the, the Coast and Strait Islands people, specifically the Lekwungen people, known today as the Songhees and the Esquimalt Nation, and recognizing that their historic connection to these lands and adjoining waterways continues to this day. As we start, uh, we just have approval of the agenda. We can move in a second, move and second. It. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? Not opposed? That carries. We move to adoption of the minutes of February 13th. Move adoptions or seconder? Seconded, thank you. Any changes, corrections, amendments? Seeing any, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? Not opposed? That carries. Uh, on to item number four, we have receipt of committee minutes and public hearing reports. There's no public hearing reports, but a series of committee minutes. We can do all three together to receive them. Uh, just a mover and a seconder, thank you. Uh, any discussion? Not seeing any, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Uh, that deals with a lot of our procedural pieces for the day. Um, my mayor's remarks, I'm going to just defer briefly. As uh, normally in our committee of the whole, we uh, we go around and have the opportunity for council to update the public and other members of council on work that they've been undertaking at various committees and boards that they sit on. Um, so because we didn't have a committee of the whole meeting last week, we are going to just allow that uh, to happen here. So I think I first need a motion to, uh, do I need to have a motion to suspend the procedures here, Mr. Coates? Oh, uh, your worship, through you, I, I would suggest not for this. Oh, not for this one. Sorry for the, the other piece. Yes, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, so I have either side of this I'm happy to go in, but maybe I'll start uh, Councillor Green with you and you can provide, let's go around the table for any updates. Thank you very much. Um, as you know, I was ill for almost a month, so missed a few things, but I did manage to get to two regional water supply commission meetings at the CRD. Um, I was able to um, attend, I will be attending in the morning in Souk, weather depending, uh, the TTAC, uh, which is the Temec Treaty Advisory Committee meeting with our CAO, Ms. Williams. Um, and I think that's it for now. Um, uh, Councillor Braithwaite attended the last tourism committee meeting for um, on my behalf and I really appreciated that she might have something to add thank you very much thank you very much Councillor Green Councillor Watson thank you mayor um yes I've had the privilege to represent us at a, a, a few things since we last did our updates one was most recently the advisory design panel um, where they did receive an input from our consultant on the sidewalk patios review and I will note and we, we may hear this subsequently that they were certainly interested in the idea um, of being a, a, a party to any future reviews of patios should they ha should we have design guidelines or things of that ilk that they would be happy to play a role. I also was happy to attend uh, the Willows Pink Shirt Day Assembly, apparently the first one that they were able to hold with all classes present since, since the onset of COVID. And they sent a thank you note to all of us. You can see it's pink, so that was very sweet. That was acknowledged. I was there also with some of the fire services staff, so uh, it was a very lively event. Um, the, um, I attended the SIP uh, Municipal Partners meeting. Um, they are about to move, I think, to bi-monthly meetings from monthly, but we got a very, very good briefing on COAST, which is one of their divisions or initiatives. That's the um, ocean research aspects. Um, and they appointed a new chair, Councillor Ken Armour from uh, Esquimalt. And finally, just an update from the archives. I have had an opportunity to meet with our archivist twice, and I'm happy to report that she's working to uh, work with, uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Coates to be able to restore volunteer presence in that shared space, and that we have acquired in the archives a number of books from Marion Cummings' collection. Uh, we were approached by the estate and asked if we would be interested, and, and Ms. Sander went and looked at those and selected some that will fill some holes in our collection. So that's all good news. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Watson. Go ahead, Councillor Appleton, and congratulations. Uh, thank you, Worship. <laughs> um, I will uh, start with just an update from the Heritage Foundation, um, which met a couple of, a couple of weeks ago, just to update uh, Council that uh, the Heritage Foundation has been working hard on creating a, a brand new website, uh, which has been a, a long time in development, so that's soon to launch. So I would ask people to keep an eye out for that. And then again, as I mentioned to Council at last update, the Heritage Seminar Series is returning as well, so that's going to be happening 
happening in short order. Um, and uh, yeah, very uh, a return to some sense of, of normal with uh, with public events. With the, the Heritage Foundation um, had the uh, attended the Greater Victoria Public Library board meeting in January, where the uh, board. Uh, well, convened with its new municipal representatives. There's a bunch of new representatives on the board, new municipal reps and, and others, and new uh, community representatives. The board um, elected their new uh, chair and vice chair, and I was uh, given the great honor and privilege of being elected as the chair of the Greater Victoria Public Library Board um, at the January meeting. So it's an, ex it's an extreme honor and a great, uh, great opportunity and a, and a great uh, experience uh, for me and I serve with a, a great group of people on that board. So uh, very, very excited to get that work underway. Um, the work uh, essentially began immediately, uh, as the council is well aware, uh, we had to deal with the shutdown of the Oak Bay branch the first week uh, of my uh, acting as chair. So I was working quite a bit with GVPL staff and Oak Bay staff uh, on the opportunity to recognize and commend everybody involved in that response, both Oak Bay staff and GVPL staff. Um, the speed at which uh, everybody responded uh, and came up with an action plan moving forward for the response. Nobody likes to have the branch closed. Everybody recognizes how extremely valuable the branch is for uh, our residents in Oak Bay. So uh, a, a quick response was uh, was very needed uh, and it's, it's underway. So uh, just my kudos to all staff involved and everybody involved to doing their best to get that underway, uh, including Mr. Meikle. Um, also, the main branch of the public library has encountered quite a few instances of significant vandalism. Um, there's been a number of smashed windows and the main branch has been closed for extended periods and has been delayed in opening on a number of different occasions. So council will probably recognize this and, and citizens will also see this happening. Um, it's a significant impact to GVPL staff. It's a significant discontinuity of service. Uh, so there's, there's some fairly significant work underway to uh, ensure that that doesn't continue and that there's a that there's a solution for that but uh, I would extend I would take this opportunity to extend my thanks specifically to the staff the GVPL staff of the Oak Bay branch who have had their uh, you know work discontinued in a number of different ways have had their branch closed and then a lot of them were actually redeployed to main branch which was itself closed and discontinued so they've encountered quite a lot of upheaval so I'd just like to take this opportunity to uh, extend my appreciation for them and then what they're doing. Um, it's an exciting time for the for the public library. We're going to be talking about a new public main branch for the for the public library, and that's going to be coming before Victoria Council in short order. We have a new strategic plan underway, um, and again, a really new and and uh, an enlivened board with lots of new members. So it's going to be some great work coming up, and I will have much to report to Council from the GVPL side um, in the upcoming year. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Councillor Appleton. Uh, as I said, congratulations. It's a yeah, place with a soft spot in my heart for the library. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Braithwaite. Uh, thanks so very much. Um, so uh, the tourism committee meeting uh, that I attended for um, Councillor Green, um, they are just uh, doing some ongoing um, advertising, etc. They have such a, a great budget to be able to do that within our community and to raise awareness about Oak Bay within within our community and, and um, further afield in uh, the U.S. and across Canada. So um, that's um, going to be some exciting things coming from tourism, I think, in the next little while. Uh, the Royal McPherson Theatre Society, we had a, a strategic planning session a few weeks ago, uh, which was um, really well attended by all of the board. Um, and um, we do have a regular meeting this coming Friday. Uh, the top of mind uh, for the Royal McPherson Theatre Society obviously is um, raising funds to be able to um, make the buildings safer and um, earthquake proof, etc. So there'll be a lot of information coming about for that as well. Uh, we do have a Parks, Rec and Culture meeting tomorrow. We'll be discussing a lot of the art policy and some new pieces of art that we have to place within the community. And I also have a BIA meeting tomorrow um, with Heather Leary. And then the Oak Bay Track um, Committee that I sit on is uh, is still trying to um, get an MOU in place and get some funding in place to replace the track at Oak Bay. So for those of you who aren't aware of that, if you would like to give money to that, that's a really good uh, thing, cause to give money to. Uh, you will be seeing more on that as well. Um, and then um, that, that's to resurface the 
track um, in, in the current state. Uh, we also have the Yes Awards coming up, which is a, a celebration of our youth in our community on March 14th. And um, the mayor and I are meeting, I, I believe, with some representatives from the Francophone Games this week, uh, as the Francophone Games are coming to our community in th this summer. Uh, and they have been uh, postponed over uh, COVID, so it's nice to see that they're actually coming this summer. And then last but not least, we have the volunteer dinner on March 11th, which I'm hoping that all of council will be able to attend. And that's it. Thank you. I think we're hosting the 2020 Francophone Games, if I recall. Yes. yes. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Smart. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, busy month for me, um, new councillor, so just excited to uh, to learn about everything. So I attended the Heritage Commission meeting earlier this month, um, and the commission wanted me to express uh, how they feel it is so important for staff, councillors, and commission members to be receiving all the same information and, and training to move forward positively. And so they wanted me to point out to everyone that their uh, staff, has, district staff, has now embedded in the agendas for the heritage meetings the link to the monthly heritage webinars for continued education, um, so that we all have the opportunity uh, to continuously um, learn. As so, just to point out, the previous webinar, um, for instance, was about the carbon benefit of renovating older buildings, and the next. Next one will be about Indigenous uh, history and heritage. Um, so um, when you have sp spare time and want to learn more, that's available. Um, heritage um, also while expressing some initial disappointment about potentially not receiving more funding at this time to proceed with their full work plan quickly rallied to come up with efficient solutions to move forward with the best practices plan in a more uh, modest focused form. Uh, and a desire was also expressed to receive a presentation in a couple months time to clarify the HCA guidelines uh, where council would also be present to receive the same information. Uh, I attended the Arts Commission um, meeting and as a um, member of the Arts Commission I felt very privileged to attend many outstanding local arts events and culture events this month including the uh, Pacific Operas the Birds and the uh, RCB our BCM's uh, National Geographic Photographer of the Year event. Um, both were fantastic. Um, and this commission is, is led by uh, Mayor Alto and it's looking not only to have the remaining municipalities uh, join, um, but also to move the commission into a role that is more fully recognized as an economic driver for city renewal. So it's a very ambitious group this year. Uh, the Climate Action Steering Committee is, is meeting uh, this week uh, for the first time, so we'll be reviewing the CRD's climate action strategy and sharing stories from our community, and I'll be sharing the cool kit successes uh, as well as our new priorities uh, for this term. As liaison to Camosun, I reached out uh, to meet the President and Director of Partnerships to discuss how we could mutually support each other. Um, it was discussed that more housing and more affordable housing for students is needed. Camosun's currently working with the Ministry to build on-campus housing on the Lansdowne campus, and they mentioned that with on-site residents, uh, that active transportation options in Oak Bay will be increasingly important for Camosun students. As part of the campus tour, I was made aware of the amazing new community event space that's available, the Wilma Thomas Building, um, which we may want to keep in mind for future community engagement sessions. Uh, I also attended the three-day leadership conference in Anaimo for elected officials. Um, additionally, lots of different meetings, cool kit meeting, patio engagement um, meeting, coldest night of the year walk, um, as well as a couple great business um, events with the B new BC Green Business uh, group as well as um, the Victoria Chamber of Commerce event. And lastly, our local Harling Point Cool Kit group had their first monthly learning session on the topic of electric bikes, scooters and cars. And despite trying to cancel it in the pouring rain, we had 20 enthusiasts show up and show off their bikes and scooters and cars. And so we'll be, we'll be having the same event uh, this Sunday, March 5th at 4 p.m. in Quimper Park. Thank you very much, Councillor Smart. Go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Yes, thank you, Mayor. And uh, I guess it, it seems like it was a busy, busy month around the table. And I appreciate uh, Councillor Appleton's comments. I, um, I had hoped to get to the main branch of the library and arrived <laughs> as the security and the police were <laughs> boarding everything up. So um, that was a little disconcerting. However, uh, they were dealing, they were managing quite effectively um, through the uh, through the episode. But um, the APC met uh, this month, and primarily the discussion was about the um, the patio cafes and uh, lots of ideas for that and suggestions, good comments from the APC members um, in, in wanting to also stay involved as this moves 
forward and um, so I hopefully um, a lot of the information will go back to the planning department staff and the engineering staff for consideration. I also attended my first Oak Bay Emergency Preparedness meeting um, which was held actually at the rec center and was a follow-up after my initial meeting with the fire chief and our program coordinator, the meeting that was held at the rec center was a, um, a coordinated regional meeting. Um, and in all of the very preliminary discussions so far, I expect that in this coming term, I will probably be with others that are involved in the program, be bringing forward some suggestions, recommendations, um, ideas for how we engage further with the community about the importance and the need for emergency response. So I think that that's um, going to be, uh, you know, an interesting but perhaps costly thing for us to consider as uh, as a municipality. Um, I attended also the, the CREST, the Emergency Radio Communications, the regional executive finance building and board <laughs> meetings. <laughs> so, uh, and um, the rollout for the communications to roll it right out through Port Port Renfrew is going per plan, so we're getting good response from the RCMP on the improved communication system for regional emergency uh, communications, and uh, the building, the planned uh, new build is still going forward according to plans, and we expect probably to have more information coming to our board meeting in May on that. As liaison to uh, Family Court Youth Justice Committee, I also attended uh, the, both the steering committee meeting and the main committee meeting this month. And um, we were informed by our Restorative Justice BC member that the federal government has established a program to assess restorative justice work in Canada. Apparently, um, the framework across Canada has um, has really lacked in support, in cohesion, and so, but our member will be participating in the um, the discussions at the with the federal government and will keep us informed about that. Um, the crime reduction exploitation division presented us with a a very, very sobering report on the increased activity. Um, around gang and sexual um, exploitation recruitment that is going on and that the age of the groups is has moved down considerably particularly with the um, many of the cases and actions now occurring over the internet instead of um, all on the streets so it makes their job um, more difficult and is especially disturbing because we we saw most of the activity junior high senior high school level but it's moved down to the elementary school level so um, the amount of resource funding and personnel that we have is extremely limited and so we will be getting recommendations coming forward with that we a lot of our resource agencies that uh, come in and talk to us about these issues really were um, severely uh, limited as to what actions they could take and they lost a lot of the resource staff during pandemic so we are uh, we will be hosting a reception for our resource members to reconnect with them following pandemic and to find out where we can advocate for support to them. But what was really refreshing at the meeting was we do also, like other committees, have many new members on the committee and the interest and the volunteering of those um, new members in, in a number of the working with the resource committees was, was really impressive. So that, that was really encouraging. So. Um, and with that, that's all I have to report on for this month. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Patterson. Um, usually, as part of my mayor's remarks, I'll do broad things, but I think I'll leave my general remarks fairly, fairly short. I, um, 
Um, but just so happens this week is also a week of lots of stuff control as well. Just very quickly give a little update. Uh, just for those, um, for the CRD, um, uh, you probably heard about there's a lot of interest in the island rail corridor, so there was a last push of, of advocacy there to ask the federal government to do what they could to protect that corridor. Um, there's also uh, interesting uh, agreed to a, a, a corporate standard for all of the parks for the CRD, and it made me think a little bit about how we sort of you know provide our, our signage and so forth. So something that um, that sort of standardization and so forth that makes for a lot of clarity. Uh, and uh, the goose management um, program service was turned up, uh, was approved. So it's, it's primarily focused on um, farmland, but for uh, we Oak Bay is included in the management area as well. So hopefully we'll see a, a, a probably slow but a steady decline of the, uh, of the of the Canada goose population uh, in the coming years. Um, I also had the uh, the opportunity to attend a, uh, through the Victoria Data Friendship. Uh, center a, uh, a symposium on urban Aboriginal voices, and it was just a really interesting chance and a reminder, uh, which I'll take back and, as we go into the discussions over time, um, that of course there's a large amount of um, uh, Indigenous people living here who are not necessarily uh, Indigenous to the area, but still have uh, very specific needs, and so uh, it was a very powerful presentation. It was really focused towards um, urban Indigenous people and had their voices at the table, but uh, it was worth really just being there to listen to it as well. Uh, I wanted to share, in, in association with Oak Bay Tourism, the uh, Destination Greater Victoria released their business plan as well, so I attended that. And uh, it's quite positive. They're looking at sort of return to pre-2019 levels uh, for tourism in the area, uh, but uh, definitely quite a ways to go before they get any of the uh, particularly Asian tourism back. Um, I also just want to, uh, as, as uh, Councillor Smart did, I went up to the LGLA, Local Government Learning Association, um, uh, through AVICC up in Nanaimo. Uh, very well done. I just wanted to just uh, give a little uh, kudos to our director of uh, uh, finance and, and asset management, uh, Christopher Payne, uh, who presented there uh, on on financial planning for for councillors. And it was uh, extremely well received and uh, very well done. So I think uh, we're trying to convince the rest of the world that they have to better manage their their asset funding over time as well. Um, and I also, I think I'll just, uh, two things, uh, one, to thank the Oak Bay Police Department who had a very successful fundraising for Special Olympics through the Polar Plunge program, and uh, also the Alliance to End Homelessness in the Capital Region, which was formally called the Coalition to End Homelessness, uh, where I sit uh, as one of the board members, uh, had our preliminary meeting today, uh, and uh, some very interesting work going on in that front, and really a, a recognition that I think we as a council can do a fair bit to support um, uh, both directly and indirectly through advocacy work and so forth. So I'll be looking to bring some of those initiatives back to this table as time goes on as well. It's probably enough. I think everybody sat through enough of these updates <laughs> for a few minutes here. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, for listening. Uh, we do move on to our public comment and question period. Um, we have a couple of delegations coming up right after this, uh, but this is just an opportunity if anybody in the audience or uh, at home wishes to address council on items that are not on the agenda. So we'll, we'll have public input on the agenda items as they arise, um, but this is really just an opportunity for people, just if there's things of general interest to the community, um, you're more than welcome to come up and we make this available up to three minutes per speaker for up to 20, 30 minutes total. I don't imagine we'll fill that much time, if any. Um, so if anybody wishes to address council on items not on the agenda tonight, you're more than welcome to just raise your hand on Zoom. Uh, if you're if you called into the 1855 number, you'd hit star nine at this point. Yeah, please come forward. And the process here is we just ask you to state your name and municipality of residence, and then you have up to three minutes to address us. So thank you. Uh, my name is Matthew Sensich. I live on uh, Newport Avenue, Oak Bay, in an apartment building. And uh, I've come before council here to suggest that the municipality needs more public gardening spaces. I looked into, you know, how you go about getting a, a public gardening space, and I was directed to a uh, facility down near the public dump. Um, and I spoke to some parks people there, and they said that there was a waiting list of 25 people for public gardening spaces, and the turnover for a new space is approximately once every one or two years a space will turn over. So that means that there's a 25 to 50 year waiting list for public gardening spaces. So I'd, I'd really like the city to create more spaces because I'd like a space myself. 
living in an apartment building. I don't have any, I don't have any land of my own that I can garden on. And um, uh, I spoke to Sherry at the uh, municipality, who I think is the mayor's assistant, and she suggested that I, if I could think of any places where I thought would be a good place to put these gardening spaces, and I thought that Windsor Park was a good place, and I'd like to suggest that uh, council consider creating an area within Windsor Park to have some public gardening spaces. I think the park is big enough to have a number of spaces, and uh, I'd just like the, the, the munis municipality to think about that and hopefully move forward on that. Uh, I'd appreciate it. And um, also, I, I'd like to suggest that um, uh, I work in the architectural field, and I worked in a, on a building in downtown Vancouver that had public gardening spaces on two roof levels, and they were, they were designed and built and uh, are much loved and used by the occupants and I think that the the city should at least consider implementing a requirement for public gardening spaces on new multi-unit buildings. Um, you know the price of real estate in Oak Bay is crazy high and uh, fewer and fewer people are going to be able to afford houses so they're going to need more public space to do things like gardening and that's it that's all I have to say. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. Uh, and I know, uh, Councillor Braithwaite, you had a brief... Go ahead. Okay. Thanks so much, Mr. Senate, for coming. Um, I will tell you that we, at the Parks, Rec and Culture meeting tomorrow, we do have this topic on the agenda um, based on the emails that we've been having back and forth. So we will be uh, discussing it um, tomorrow, and that will be kind of a first glance that that committee has had to be able to look at that. And then re um, recommendations from that committee will come to Council. Um, and um, so hopefully if there's some recommendations that will come back to the Council table. So. Fingers crossed that we'll be able to do something to get more gardening plots. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any other uh, members of public that wish to address us on items not on the agenda tonight? Okay, sorry, Councillor Smart, you're not really a member of the public, but go ahead. Okay, sorry, I was just trying to, um, if I could further comment um, towards Hazel's comment. I just wanted to mention um, that the Cool Kit um, uh, groups, many of them have uh, discussed and identified spaces in different areas of Oak Bay for that as well. So just maybe to be in touch with the Parks Department about that. And I always like just to point out to people, there are some interesting garden swapping organizations or, or nonprofits as well that uh, that make, if people have parts of their own property that they're happy to have gardened, uh, they get a little cut of your your vegetables and they take they take part of it. So I know those are those are out there as well. Although I think they got really hurt by COVID, so I'm not sure what the current status is. I don't see any other hands popping up, uh, so I think I'm going to call the public comment and question period to conclusion, and uh, we'll move on to the. Uh, uh, we have just a motion to waive rules here. Or is this just to, if I can get someone to read that? Uh, so this is to suspend the rules of procedures to permit the two delegations. These normally come to Committee of the Whole, but again, we didn't have Committee of the Whole this month, so we're just going to have it at this table. Moved and seconded. Thank you. Uh, any discussion on waiving that? I think we need a two-thirds majority, but I don't anticipate a, not making that. All those in favor? Any opposed, not opposed? That carries. Uh, so uh, we have uh, two delegations here today. Uh, under our rules of business, we have uh, five minutes per uh, to give a presentation, and after the five minutes is up, I'll time you. Uh, I will, and I'll call you to a halt at five minutes, but we will have time for questions afterwards. Uh, again, under the procedures, we don't typically have motions to do things. We just, we're typically receiving the information at this point, but we can ask questions and get some clarifications and, 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 and next steps if possible. But first, we have, uh, we have the... Capital Bike, I believe, is up first on our uh, list. And we have Mr. Berger and Mr. Is it Cooper or Crupper? Uh, Cooper. Cooper. Sorry, I should have asked that before the meeting started. They, they, when I arrived this evening uh, around 5.30, I had I left my pass to get in the door behind, so I had to knock on the door, and they were very they were kind enough to let me into this building, so... <laughs> I owe them something now. Um, we're uh, welcome this evening, and uh, uh, just if you could just introduce yourselves more formally, and then once you do, I'll start the timer. Thank you. 
Thanks very much. I am Corey Berger. I'm the Policy and Infrastructure Chair for Capital Bike. I've been on the board of Capital Bike and the GVCC and Bike to Work before that since 2016. And with me, I have Adam Cooper, who has been our Executive Director for a few years. So Welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Um, oh, is it possible to get 10 minutes? Is that an under? No. OK, we'll move on then. Uh, always ask. You never know. <laughs> so next slide, please. So uh, we'd like to talk to you today about our uh, Roadmap for Cycling Success, which is something we internally have uh, worked with uh, members of the public and uh, our members across the region to look at to, to figure out where can we get to by 2026. So within your council term, where can we, how can we be a bit better cycling region? And we're going out to each different council in turn. We've been to Saanich, we're coming here, we're talking to the other municipalities about each each one. And, you know, although they're, you're all in different places, many of the things that you'll be doing are very common across them. So next slide, please. So we have three really top actions. And so for that, I'm going to turn you over to Adam to talk a little bit about those. Thank you very much. So the, we're trying to. So you'll notice that at your desk you have the Oak Bay plan, and what we've tried to do is really boil it down to simple, actionable ac items that um, are smart goals. And so the top three that we just want to emphasize is one: uh, we know based on reams of information that protected bikeways are the way to go. It truly does make it accessible for all. Number two is to uh, establish a fund. It doesn't matter if it's big or large, but specifically for active transportation projects that are not tied to capital projects, which gives the municipality the flexibility to take on new and emerging projects that address immediate community needs. Number three is to develop and revise the municipal bike parking standards um, so that we know that when people get to uh, the end of their journey or they are living somewhere, they have somewhere to place their vehicles. Next slide. Thank you. So the first big piece, uh, obviously, is a network for all. So if you want to hit the next slide, please. Um, so there, there's four actions here. The first one is really establish an all ages and abilities network. And that says to the public, to, to the wider world, this is where we want people to be able to ride of all ages and abilities. Uh, the second is, we've seen this in Saanich over the last uh, year or so, this idea of a quick build network. Go out there, put down some potentially temporary materials. I know there's some discussion around McNeil here, around possibly looking at a shared, a shared street using quick build. Something like that can be done much more broadly. Uh, Saanich is moving on 13 kilometers, I believe, of their buffered bike lanes to protect it this year, so it's, it's quite amazing. Uh, the third is really about making sure that you meet or exceed BC's standards. So BC's got a really great active transportation design guideline. I strongly encourage you to read it. It's very accessible for even non-engineers. Um, and it's in there, it talks, it's, you know, guided by... is a great way to build bikeways, and it talks about all the sort of trade-offs you might have. And we strongly encourage you to take those and exceed them. And then the third one really is about filling gaps and connecting communities. I mean, Oak Bay is lucky enough to host you two of the, the region's three big uh, um, uh, post-secondary institutions, UVic and Camosun. There's already been some discussion about AT at Camosun. I know UVic has written a letter in support of the um, of the work on Henderson, and that might be an example of where you might want to look at a quick build network. You can not only make that a full-time bike lane, but maybe figure out if there's a way to even add some protection on that in a, in the short period of time. So these are the four big items that are built in around uh, a network for all. So Excellent. next slide, please. So I'll pass you back to Adam for talking about behavior change. So behavior change, next slide. So there are three main action areas that I'm just going to outline. One is policy and legislation. Number two is staff programs. And the third one is public programs. Next slide. So in terms of policy legislation, why? Because policy legislation is fairly low ca cost, but there's a high impact. And it also broadly improves safety for everyone. Next slide. So a few examples are Im implementing one meter passing rules in your traffic bylaw, implementing 30 kilometer an hour speed limits on local roads, Third, uh, supporting broad Motor Vehicle Act improvements that are meant to improve safety for all road users. Next slide. The next is staff programs. And so why? It's because the municipality is a very large employer. And as a large employer, there are things that you can do to affect behavior change and reduce barriers. So next slide. 
So for example, um, sorry, uh, the municipality can, can actually have a, a, a champion within the corporation that, uh, that champions go by Bike Week, if everybody knows what that is. Another one is having e-bikes available for staff at various staff facilities so people don't have to necessarily drive automobiles, and looking for places where uh, people can replace an, an, a, a cargo bike or a car with a, or an e-bike car with a cargo bike. Yes, that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Such as FedEx, which is actually replacing a lot of their automobile trips with e-bikes. Uh, and then also another idea is uh, if there are staff who want to purchase e-bikes, um, but we know that the cost is a barrier, uh, and having purchasing programs which reduce, uh, have very low uh, interest rates, but uh, make it accessible. Next slide. And public programs, why? Because the municipality has a lot of sway with the public. They've got great ways of messaging to the public. And so you can, you can enhance people's cycling skills. You can create a sense of community around cycling. So next slide. And so here's a couple of examples supporting Go By Bike Week. So the municipality can provide funding to have a local Go By Bike Week celebration station. Um, uh, Saanich actually has a great e-bike incentive program which has made it easier for people to purchase e-bikes by offering incentives to low-income individuals. Um, when, a municip when the municipality runs uh, events, have Bike Valet there. It's a simple service, but it provides something, it, it makes it easier for people to ride their bikes and not to worry about theft. And then um, supporting in-school cycling education. So Oak Bay has the, the largest, as far as I know, elementary school in the region, and it has one of the largest uh, middle schools. So uh, there are organizations like us that provide cycling education to those schools, and so providing funding to support that. Next slide. Going to ask you to try and wrap it up. Or, or Perfect. Yeah. Uh, well, the last piece is really about uh, safe places to park bikes. It's where you put it at the end. I mean, you probably saw our bikes parked out front today. Uh, the key one around here really is about m making sure your bylaws work. As you add new buildings and you renovate buildings, making sure that those bylaws get the best possible bike parking, because some of those buildings might be around for a hundred or more years. And I believe next slide, and then I believe you can take us all the way to the end. Next slide. So there's, Oak Bay has a huge amount of potential. You actually have uh, one of the highest mode shares for journey to work in the region. You're, I think you're the highest. You might have dropped in 2021, but you're pretty close to it. And again, you have those, uh, those two post-secondary institutions. There's a lot of opportunity here, short trip distances. And, but there's a, what we need is, some, is action, really, is to move in the next four years on building bikeways, changing bylaws, and uh, creating some action. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, at this point, uh, we'll take a few questions if there are any, and then we'll move on to the next presentation. Uh, any questions? Go ahead, Councillor Appleton. Well, thank you, Your Worship. And through you to our guests, I'd just like to take this opportunity to say thank you. evidence-based design and a lot of research in other jurisdictions that informs what you're bringing forward to Council, so thank you for that. Um, I was just wondering whether you might be able to speak to, uh, you know, Council is considering uh, the scope and scale of building out the minimum active transportation network. Um, it's something that we've discussed around the Council table, so I'm just wondering whether you might be able to speak to the significance or the, the effect on mode share that can be affected by constructing that minimum network and what kind of impact that can have. So there's actually some really great research done here in the region looking at uh, how people might want to bike. So it's there's a program called IBEMS, which is the Impact of Bicycle Infrastructure in Mid-Sized Cities, uh, and it surveys residents of Oak Bay, Victoria, Saanich, and uh, Squimalt, looking at the impact of primarily the city of Victoria's network, but obviously because they're surveying Oak Bay residents, they also get opinions. And what the two top findings from there, which are similar to across everywhere, are people want to ride more and they want to ride on protected infrastructure more. So that's really where that comes down to. And then in terms of build out, you know, the if you look at the most of the planning documents, they say sort of a 400 meter minimum grid. Um, and so that would look like the major roads. Oak Bay is a fairly small place. So it wouldn't, it isn't actually that much work to figure out where your network is. The 2011 plan is actually pretty good for its network. It just needs really just to be updated on what you're building essentially. Thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Green. Did, did you have anything else, Councillor Appleton? 
Thank you, very, Your Worship. Uh, through you to our guests, I'm just wondering, do, you know, e-bikes come up a number of times in your presentation, and I, I get the sense that especially in our community with, you know, our median age is, uh, you know, a chunk older than the rest of the, uh, than the rest of the CRD. Um, I get the sense that e-bikes are affecting a significant change in, in mode share and, and in usage in, in the older populations. So I just wonder if you comment on that or whether there's any statistics being tracked about, you know, adoption rates for uh, older folks. Unfortunately, I don't have statistics on on the uh, on on the adoption rates, but um, we interact with about twelve different bike shops for through Go by Bike Week, and we talk to them about where where sales are, are growing and where they're stagnant, and they all say that the area of the, the prime area of growth is uh, is through e-bikes. Uh, they, they say e-bikes uh, sales are growing, have been growing consistently every year for the past 10 years, and now they make up the bulk of their new sales. So we know that it's a huge, huge area, and there's a ton of people who are, who are taking up e-bikes. And we also know that in terms of providing an accessible, accessible mode of transportation, e-bikes are, uh, are, are, we know that a lot of, like, let's say older folks are, are gravitating towards them. Um, for a number of reasons, it, it reduces, it makes hills, it basically flattens hills. Um, it, it increases their people's stability when they're starting because they don't, because if you if you lack explosive muscular power, um, the, the motor does the work for you so you get to a stable speed very quickly. It also um, reduces the fear of distance because uh, an e-bike will go 70 kilometers with 40% assist. <laughs> and so people don't have to worry about riding wherever they want to go. So we know that's a huge, uh, huge factor. And then in terms of families, e-bikes are huge because so many, so almost every cargo bike comes with with a motor, and so young families are up. To, are, are, there's a huge uptake for young families with cargo bikes because it's allowing them to actually reduce their overall household costs because they don't have to buy two vehicles or three vehicles. They've got a cargo bike and an automobile. Uh, I can actually answer the e-bike uptake question. So the Capital Regional District is busy doing a household travel study right now. Um, and in that, they're asking about uh, yeah, bicycle and e-bicycle ownership. So th I believe um, through the chair, you probably would be able to ask at the CRD board about getting that information. Yeah, thank you. I don't think it's back yet, but I'll, I'll find out. Uh, Councilor Green, you had a question? I did. Thank you. And through you, thank you to you both. Um, for coming tonight and for the presentation. Really helpful. Will you help define something for me and what is meant by all abilities, all ages? Um, I have some friends who happen to have mobility issues and so I'm, I'm struggling a little bit to understand the inclusive in inclusivity of, of AAA. So if you could help me with that, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. So the term AAA came from the city of Vancouver uh, when they started looking at building out their protected bike lane network about 10 years ago. And it is it is an evolving definition as we go on, is one of the key things that's happened is, as, as Councillor uh, Appleton noted, uh, e-bikes are changing the game. Um, and what is accessible is rapidly expanding. And there are absolutely, we will recognize there are a group of people who cannot ride a bicycle for a lot of reasons. Um, but the most recent, the IBM study, which I mentioned, shows that that's actually less than the number of people who don't have a driver's license in the region. So there is, you know, somewhere around 75 to 80% of the population can ride a bicycle without, uh, without uh, challenge. Um, and things like e-trikes and things like that are making it so that someone who might have balance issues are able to get on and the, the electric assist will, if you have, say, uh, you know, muscular issues, the electric assist will, will take up those those gaps essentially. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Oh, uh, go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Yes, thank you, Mayor, and thank you very much for the presentation. It was interesting. Um, I do have uh, a question you you raised in your presentation that um, road speeds should be limited to thirty kilometers an hour, which. I support. I'm a, an avid pedestrian, so slower speeds are good. And I'm just wondering if you have any information. I know since there's been a bit of a, um, a an uptake in e-bikes, speeds seem to have increased um, with the e-bike um, use. Um, and also, if there is any, um, if there are yet any accident statistics. Um, relative to uh, either car, bike uh, statistics, or bike p 
pedestrian statistics? Um, related to the first one, um, the 30 kilometer an hour, uh, you know, that applies to all vehicles, including bikes as well. Uh, bikes like my own, I have a family cargo bike, uh, is uh, speed limited at about 31.8. The motor kicks out. Um, and it is somewhat difficult to get beyond that. Uh, <laughs> some giving it away so much. Some e-bikes, obviously, you can go f go faster, and there are people, unfortunately, who choose to use e-bikes illegally. Um, but it is federally regulated as well. So there's so there are there's a there's a lot of pieces, and that's an e-bike regulation is an evolving area right now. Um, as to uh, crash statistics, so the Capital Bike has a seat on the Series Traffic Safety Commission, uh, and we're actually in the middle of a, a data collection exercise uh, looking at what actually gets collected. Uh, I happen to sit on that subcommittee. Um, and so we're going to be coming back to the CRD, so this would be something, again, uh, you know, that you could ask the chair to, to bring back through the CRD Transportation Committee back to here, uh, looking at that those initial stats. Unfortunately, one of the challenges we have in the region is that, uh, in BC in general, uh, crashes that involve a, an insured motor vehicle uh, would be collected by ICBC. A small number of crashes will be col crashes will be collected uh, by your police department, but that is we know that is an uh, not a full picture of, of crashes. Estimates are somewhere motor vehicle bike crashes are somewhere in the range of fifty percent of all bike crashes. But getting better estimates is very difficult. Thank you. Well, thank you. Oh, go ahead, Councillor Watson. Thank you. If I just may ask a question too, I'm curious about the issue of bike storage as we get more riders and larger bikes, particularly electronic cargo bikes. And I just wondered if you could comment on what you see the trajectory of and how you would be advising local governments to plan for that reality because it is something they need to plan for. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Watson. Go ahead. Yeah, through the chair, that's a great question and uh, it's something that we've talked about a lot. Um, so one thing is uh, having standards, like um, so your, your engineering department has got a design standard for, for what are the space requirements for, for each e-bike and for different types of e-bikes. And then the next one, of, of course, is changing your, um, your uh, site plan requirements. And this, this our suggestion is to change your site plan requirements when it's a multi-dwelling uh, multi unit to a, a, a provide, just like you do for car spaces, they're saying if there's six families have two spaces available for, for e-bikes. And an important part of that is providing charging as well. Um, prefer, it's, of course, it's preferable if it's, if it's covered, it's preferable if it's lockable, um, if it's a part of the physical structure. So these, these types of things. I know Esquimalt was looking at doing that as well, and, some of the, and, and I know Vancouver uh, strongly encourages developers to do that. So it is, that is the trajectory that municipalities are going in. And right now is a really good time to look at it because we're starting to see the societal shifts involved and, and uh, with people adopting cargo bikes and e-bikes and we're starting to see the, the, um, the technology mature and the availability of different types of vehicles mature. For example, Bishop Cycle is, is, a, is a bike shop which just carries cargo bikes and e-bikes. That's how far things have changed in the past 10 years. So I think um, with peer communities working on that same thing, now is a really good time for municipalities to kind of make that decision. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to explicitly mention that both Saanich at least, and possibly Victoria, are both looking to redo their parking bylaws this year. So this would be an opportunity for some regional collaboration and an opportunity for Oak Bay Council to reduce your own costs by uh, piggybacking on other people's work. Thank you. See any other questions popping up here? So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Cooper, Mr. Berger, for your time. Uh, that was very, very inter in interesting and educational, and I appreciate the, uh, uh, the framework here and personalizing it a little bit for our community. So thank you for that. Um, we now have a presentation for traffic safety at Cedar Hill Crossroad. We have a Mr. Walzak, and there's somebody else, or Ms. Walzak, I'm not sure, and then a, um, there's a second, uh, Coral Martin as well. I'm not sure if they were part of the presentation or not, so welcome to. Okay. <laughs> for the record and uh, in your then we'll just kick off and you have five minutes and then we'll have time for questions afterwards as well.
All right, thanks very much. Um, my name is Ali Walzak. I am a physician by day job at the Jubilee Hospital. I'm a, a mom, that's my all the time job. I'm joined by Andrea Sigsworth, who's a occupational therapist at the Jubilee as well, and a mom of two school aged children. We're here to talk to you today about the safety and accessibility of Cedar Hill Crossroad. Um, next slide, please. So, just to orient you of where we're talking about, this is right at the kind of northern border of Oak Bay, right where it butts up to Saanich. And as you can see, the Cedar Hill Crossroads section that we're li really talking about is between Gordon Head Road and Henderson Road. So there are three main issues that we're gonna discuss this, uh, this evening. The first of those being sight lines for both pedestrians and for motorists. Next slide, please. So we took a couple of photos to help understand really what this looks like as both a pedestrian and a motorist. Mm -hmm. So the left-hand picture here is if you're a pedestrian crossing at the crosswalk, looking left onto Cedar Hill Crossroads, you have cars coming up that are looking to see if the way is clear coming out of UVic. And it's really quite obstructed there by a very large row of hedges. Um, and then if you look on the right side of the slide there, that's as, you, as you're a car, a motorist coming up to the same intersection. And as you can see, you can't even really see the full scope of the crosswalk there. And you're, that's probably about a 10 to 15 meter distance there from the crosswalk to where the car would be. Again, those hedges are, are quite obstructive. So the other issue in terms of speed, not only during the daytime when sight lines are probably better, is at nighttime, especially during the kind of late hour, 8 p.m. to 2 a.m., many drivers treat this area as a bit of a drag strip. Um, Oak Bay Police are aware of the issue. We've talked to them. Unfortunately, they don't have, of course, the personnel to man this road 24-7, but they are aware that there is some major, major excessive speed issues, upwards of 80 to 100 kilometers an hour on this neighborhood street. Um, so the, that's kind of the major issue in terms of speed. From my perspective, personally, as a, a mom to a 10-month-old daughter, I've done many walks around the neighborhood trying to get my daughter to nap. Crossing these crosswalks can be a harrowing experience with children, um, whether they're in a stroller. I've actually want, walked backwards through the crosswalks so that I'm first and I'm not pushing my daughter first across the stroller crosswalks. Um, so it can be a, a very dangerous type of situation. Um, I should mention as well that through uh, Andrea and I and one of our um, neighbors, John, who couldn't be here tonight, we've accrued over 200 signatures through both an online and paper petition from parents at Campus View School, which Andrea will talk a little bit more about, from fellow neighbors in our neighborhood, from residents in ad adjacent neighborhoods, as well as UVic students and staff. We know that this is a very, very highly trafficked corridor for all members of this very close-knit community. Um, the third issue is regarding uh, accessibility and sustainability, and I'm going to pass it over to Andrea to mention that as well. Okay. Um, and just, this is the paper or petition here, so I can submit that. I've talked to 98 people and 96 people signed, just to give you a sense of how people are feeling about this. And then, so from an OT perspective, when I look at something like this, it really doesn't speak to universal design and accessibility for all of the population, right? Anyone with impairment issues, visual perceptual issues, are not able to manage in this intersection safely, right? And that's kind of obvious just in the space that's available for people to walk. And then the lighting, the signage, other kind of components of that. Um, the other kind of idea with this is that we're looking at a green initiative and trying to get people out of their cars. And so if we want to do that, we need to make it safe for people to be in the community, to be on their bikes and to be walking. And that's not really congruent with what we see here, especially with the speed of traffic and kind of the other things that we've highlighted. And then the part that kind of hits closest to home for me and for moms is that all of the kids who live in North Oak Bay have to go through these intersections to get to Campus View every day. So that's putting our young population at risk. For me, I have a daughter with disabilities. She has, this is where I'm gonna like try not to choke up. <laughs> but she has motor impairments, autism, and developmental delay, and she's vulnerable. And all of the kids in the neighborhood are. And so that doesn't have to be. We have knowledge and we have procedures in place that we can make this infrastructure safer for all of the population, and I think we have a responsibility to do that, not just for my daughter, but for all the kids in the neighborhood who are passing through that area every day. Next slide, please. <coughs> One of the other areas of accessibility that really makes this area difficult is there is a bus stop, actually. So as Andrew mentioned, this is a major area of green initiatives that we can really focus on, but there's no sidewalk on that side of the, of the road. And so if you have people that want to be taking the bus to and from UVic, they actually have to run across that road. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, they're forced to kind of go to one of the other crosswalks, which again are, are also fraught with major casualties if we look at the ICBC data. So um, next slide, please. 
Um, of course, we are not the experts here. We're coming here to you to, to ask for your help, but these are some suggestions that our neighbors and our colleagues have talked to us about. So one thing that has been suggested is to look at installing a raised crosswalk over to that bus stop. This would probably achieve a couple things. One is to allow that accessibility to the bus stop for those who are using strollers, using wheelchairs or other uh, implements. The other thing is it would actually help to decrease the speed. If we have a bit of a speed hump on that road, that sort of kills two birds with one stone. The other thing is we'd really like to have an in-depth look at those intersections from an engineering community planning perspective so that we can actually look at those sight lines and understand what can we do to make these safer. Can we install different sets of lights or crosswalks or stop signs? What do we, do, what do we need to do to make these intersections safer for pedestrians and cyclists? And then the third thing is, is something that, you know, obviously we can't be out there at one in the morning patrolling these very, very dangerous drivers that are putting our community at risk. So we need to, I think, work with the Oak Bay Police mm -hmm. Department really to make sure that they understand this is an area of concern, even though it's right at the border. And I think Saanich and Oak Bay share this area, but we need to make sure that this is an area of active patrol. Yeah, it's really extreme, actually. Like, you, you don't maybe necessarily realize it, but people in their homes, like, even further up the road, like, by Mount Holmey, can hear the racing at night. Like, it's pronounced, and it's kind of constant. So, um, yeah, that's just kind of another component mm -hmm. for me for tonight. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're happy to take questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. And and so tonight, we'll, we may ask questions of you, or we may ask questions of staff, and then... There won't be any direction specifically from this, but we will have some, we may be able to provide some additional uh, uh, pieces of feedback back to staff. And, uh, go ahead, Councilor Braithwaite. Um, thanks very much, Mary. Thanks very much, um, ladies, for coming tonight. And look up Mount Tolmy from our house and then down and, and past that exact intersection. And I have almost been hit a couple of times of at that yeah. intersection. Um, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, the um, my, my question is, well, two things. Um, that um, that crosswalk does have a, a beeping crosswalk on it, does it not? I Yes, okay. Um, but the, the, the hedge itself, and this I guess is more of a question to staff, is does that hedge infringe? It's infringing on our sidewalk, but is that hedge... Um, do we know if that hedge is part of the um, neighbors, the, the, the residents' property, and, and therefore they're supposed to be cutting it back, or do we know whether or not it's on our boulevard and it's actually owned by the municipality? Um, I'm going to have the only person here I think can answer that question is probably Mr. Robertson. Do you, do you, have, do you know him? This is our Sorry. director of engineering. We don't have answers to all these questions tonight. <laughs> Just for clarity, is that the southwest corner? The southwest corner. <coughs> yes. Yes. So, from my understanding, that is a private hedge, but staff uh, have been in contact with the property owner to have it uh, trimmed back, uh, but it's not an Oak Bay hedge. Uh, and then, um, I guess the the the, the um, speed bump kind of um, idea that you have uh, for the crossing to the bus station to the bus stop, that would be similar to what they have on Gordon Head Road, okay. And um, I'm assuming that um, District of Saanich would have put those um, speed bumps in on that side, that it wouldn't really have had anything to do with the university. I'm just trying to look for if there's any ability to partner with the university to be able to pay for. Um, Things like that are really expensive, so I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity to, to partner, and that might be something that staff can look at at a different time. Um, can I just speak to that? So I've been in touch with UVic as well, and we have support through the UVic Student Society, and Izzy, who is a face up there, um, is supporting it as well, and so she said that I could speak for their organization to say that they definitely support safety changes in that area as well. Thank you. I think the, to the to the broader wonder of cost sharing, uh, it's, uh, that's a harder one. Um, but we have certainly undertaken. We, we we did a grant application on behalf of UVic who couldn't apply for a grant on some active transportation work last last year. And uh, I think we can probably work together on those sorts of pieces to put things in. But not to say that's the piece. But yeah, go ahead, Councillor Green. Oh, sorry, I had Councillor Apple and the Councillor Green. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and, and through you, this is probably to staff, and I don't want to put staff on the on the spot here, and I apologize for not directing the question beforehand, but um, it, we have the sense that there are no jurisdictional issues around the intersection itself, as in, like, the, the intersection in its entirety is within 
Oak Bay's jurisdiction. The only reason I ask that is because we ran into this uh, topic when we talked about the McNeil and Fowl Bay intersection, which turns out to not be very much actually within Oak Bay. So I just wanted to confirm that that was the case. And Mr. Robertson? Yeah, through the mayor, I do believe that that whole intersection is within Oak Bay. Thank you, Worship. I would just take the the opportunity to, to to make the comment. Thank you very much for attending, and I and I do appreciate the suggestions. I think, uh, at least to my mind, you know, when I look at that intersection and when I look at the the, the pedestrian crossing that you're mentioning, um, it reminds me very much of uh, the redesign of the Cabarro Bay and Bowker intersection, which also had slip lanes of a similar nature. And how, going through both of those intersections on my bicycle, probably. I don't know, <laughs> several hundred times each. Um, I know that the comfort level of going around the corner and turning onto Bowker off of Cabro Bay and knowing that you're not going to be facing into a slip lane is significant. So I, I think that it's fairly broadly recognized now that as these things are, are redesigned, that slip, line, slip lanes are essentially being uh, taken out of service broadly. So I, I think that there's definitely a, a potential improvement there. I'm not going to speak for engineering when we go so far as to do that, but certainly I know from my personal experience that that's been an improvement for me. Thank you, Councillor Alvin. Councillor Green? And then Councillor Smart. Yes, thank you. And through you, thank you very much for coming today. I really appreciate it. Um, I too have concerns about that intersection, have done for quite some time. Um, one of the questions I had uh, is whether or not that bus stop can be moved to a safer location. That's one question. Um, the other one is that in terms of partnership, um, it might be um, an opportunity for partnership with UVic, but also with Saanich, because ultimately this this whole area serves both um, both municipalities and and UVic sits in the center of that so there are some possibilities here but um, I do appreciate your concerns very much and I'm hoping that um, we can look at this carefully thank you can I just add to that or uh, yeah we'll take it as a question and I'll give it to you sure oh okay <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that when I talk to people doing this petition, so I've talked to 98 people and almost everybody is in agreement and has an example kind of like yours of having felt they've had a close call or you know the principal of Campus View, his wife was hit in that intersection last year. So just to give you a sense of kind of the groundswell around this. Thank you, Councillor Smart and Councillor Patterson. Uh, thank you, through you, Mayor, um, to Mr. Robertson with the advance apology of not asking the question early and potentially putting you on the spot. I'm wondering if um, if there's a typical um, bylaw around sight lines at corners that would enact more than a simple trimming of, of the hedge. Um, and I'm just wondering like, if there, if there is a, a standard that you're aware of and apologies if it's too specific to this corner or if it's generally like throughout every um, corner, just wondering about sight line clearances and, and actual distance from the sidewalk to the hedge allowances. Mr. Robertson? Yes, through the mayor. Um, I don't believe there would be a bylaw specifically for that, but as far as uh, intersection design from a transportation uh, standpoint, um, there are certain guidelines for designing intersections. Um, so it would come under that sort of a, um, a review and a design process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. Yes, thank you, Mayor, and thank you so much for coming and presenting to Council. Um, I agree with most of my fellow councillors around the table. It is a difficult intersection, and as a public transit user, I have been uh, forced to disembark from a fairly full bus at a bus stop where, where there's no sidewalk and you have to run across very quickly. So, uh, you know, I, I can certainly, I certainly appreciate the dilemmas. Um, what, I'm, what I am wondering is, when we talk about excessive speeds, are the excessive speeds primarily along the Cedar Hill corridor? Um, do they slow? Is, uh, is more of the traffic that is turning then onto Henderson is it in fact slowing down because that is of course a reduced speed area and so I'm just trying to to understand if there's a slowdown in the traffic obeying those rules and most of the problem is along the Cedar Hill corridor. 
not sure um, it's fair to ask you that question about yeah, most cars, but yeah. so <laughs> a, answer as you I, see fit. But. Yeah, if I, if I could sit there and, and track everyone, I would, I would tell you the stats. But um, in my experience, and Andrew can probably see this as well, is um, cars go very, very quickly when there's not a lot of traffic on that road, which is why there, there's a lot of speeding you know, in the nighttime <laughs> and overnight hours. Of course, if there's high volume, which there is, people can't go faster than 50 or 60. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the main concerns is that people don't typically slow down through the yield of that intersection. Mm -hmm. So they kind of maintain speeds of 30 to 50 going around a corner. Mm -hmm. um, so even though there's the, the beeping pedestrian crosswalk, if you're in the yield, um, in that little crosswalk, there's no beeping, there's no lights there, and that's where the, the real speed becomes a challenge for pedestrians and cyclists, actually. So I'm, I'm glad mm -hmm. we heard, by, uh, heard, heard from our, um, you know, our, our friends here with the Go By Bike because uh, really that bike lane as well, we didn't mention it in today's presentation, but the bike lane is heavily compromised as well mm -hmm. by that same yield lane. Mm -hmm. and, and the people kind of coming to turn right onto Henderson aren't looking where the pedestrians are, they're looking to make their light, right? So they're going fast. They're hanging a right trying to make the merge, and so they don't see the bikes, they don't see the people that are coming up, and then that's in part because of the hedge, but it's also just the way that they're directing their attention and the speed that they've developed. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I might just put a quick question to staff on, on this one in terms of, obviously we have, this intersection is a problem. Uh, we have many, <laughs> the universal design was not unfortunately a, a thing when we, uh, when Oak Bay was built out and so we have a, we have a long list of things. So uh, maybe just ask, can you uh, understand the, how the priorities are set? So you know, we have multiple intersections, multiple problems, multiple curb cuts to do, all those sorts of things. Can you give us some sense of like when issues like this are raised, um, how, they're, how they're adjudicated, how the engineering department goes about looking at them, how those become capital projects, where and if they come back to the public realm or council. Just a general highlight of, of, of how engineering deals with this not, not unique problem, but in a situation like this. Yes, uh, through the mayor. Um, I can't say specifically for Oak Bay. Um, I haven't had a discussion on, on this yet, uh, but I would say from past experience, uh, looking at uh, ICBC uh, accident data, uh, looking at any data from the local police department, um, and that's the sort of data that we would use uh, to look at whether an intersection needs to be, like the geometry needs to be reviewed uh, because the standards may have changed since the design was originally done. Okay, thank you. And there's a and there's a priority list then that comes out based on that, on those statistics and is revised periodically. Is that the process? Um, I can't comment on that. Okay. Yeah. I looked at the Mr. ICBC Ro stats. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. okay. It's, yeah. Uh, Mr. I, it's going to give Mr. Robertson a, a fair shake here. He's joined us just a few weeks ago and is still getting up to speed in our <laughs> internal <laughs> operations. So. But I don't want to speak to the specifics of this over any others because that's not fair to put on you to where this fits in the overall scheme of things. Um, I think we're, well, at this point, this will be, unless there's any other questions of members of council, I'm going to just thank you both very, very much for coming in here tonight. I think it's very, very educational and helpful for us to hear these things and for staff and, uh, and staff will definitely take it away and look at where this is in that, in that picture of things. Please, if you could leave the uh, petition, mm -hmm. uh, just leave it at the back table and then that'll form part of our formal record as well and also helpful to us. And the petitions are ongoing as well, so we'll just kind of keep you guys up to date as they go through, I guess. That's good. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Thank uh, you. So yeah. Thank you so much. <coughs> yeah, perfect. <coughs> well, thank you very much uh, for those two present uh, delegations. Uh, we are going to move on to uh, the balance of the uh, agenda here. So up in the first we have 9.1. We have the Alan Cassidy Recognition and Renovation Awards. Um, we have the, it is subject to public input. If anybody wishes to address council on this, there will be an opportunity. So if you're calling into the 1855 number, you can hit star nine to raise your hand, or if you're on Zoom, you can raise your hand. Um, and then I'll see you when I get to the public uh, input portion. Uh, process wise is uh, we'll get a quick overview uh, from staff to reflect on the, on the report. We'll have a chance for council to ask questions, go to the public for uh, any questions or comments, and then we'll come back to this table for motions and deliberations. So with that, uh, uh, moving on, we have uh, Mr. Mr. Muller. Welcome. It's the first time we've had you in the uh, in the uh, in the room. So welcome. Thank you. Um, I have a Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If I could uh, start off. 
We also have Andre with us, with us <laughs> on the call too. So you were, you were hidden away there for a second, yeah. Mr. Mr. Bull. So oh. Mr. Bull is our, our director of uh, community building and planning. So he will kick this off, and then we'll hand it over here. So I'll let you do the introductions. Thank you, Mr. Bull. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and, and sorry, I couldn't be with you tonight in person. I'm coping with some minor cold symptoms. Um, but today, I'm happy to introduce Bradley Muller to you, our planning technician who is with you in the room there. He has joined us in January, and he uh, brings over five years of experience in building permit and development application processing uh, in Manitoba. And uh, he was a planning consultant and engagement specialist there. Um, before I hand it over to Mr. Muller for an introduction into the uh, policy uh, changes, uh, I would like to mention that we, we did discover a typo in the draft policy this morning and we corrected that. So there are some references to ADP versus APC and Heritage Commission jumbled in the text, but we did correct that in the package this morning. And uh, we also made sure that um, most of the policy now refers to the panel rather than the ADP, because as you will here in a moment, the panel is a bit wider now than uh, it was originally uh, envisioned. So with that, Mr. Muller has a uh, presentation, a couple of slides to highlight the proposed changes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bull. Welcome back again, Mr. Muller. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so as you all know, the Alan Cassidy Awards are a biannual uh, award to pr uh, presented by the Oak Bay uh, District Council um, to property owners in appreciation of uh, architecture and, and recognition of uh, building renovations. Um, most recently, uh, next slide, please. Uh, during the council meeting on January 9th, 2023, uh, staff was presented uh, a, a report with a draft policy. Um, decisions were um, a discussion was held, and uh, and uh, discussion was held, and uh, and the importance of environmental sustainability and, so, and social benefits were brought up, and um, they were considered to be viable uh, considerations for the future building and uh, re renovation awards. Um, Oh, sorry, for, for they're uh, considered. Uh, sorry, um, they were considered for the future. Uh, my my apologies. Uh, so, importance of environmental sustainability and social benefits. Uh, and council indicated that they were viable considerations um, for for the um, criteria for the the awards. Uh, future discussion was kind of was held. Um, it was also highlighted the importance of increased public participation and representation from from uh, existing uh, ADP or uh, advisory body members. So that that being the Heritage Commission and uh, the Advisory Planning Commission. Next slide, please. Um, so the two motions that were passed are the. awards policy be referred back to staff to consider and provide options uh, for additional public participation uh, in the process from existing committees and that staff this th that staff report back with expanded options for consideration for the for the awards including environmental sustainability and social considerations next slide please so as part of our the report uh, staff have included environmental sustainability and social considerations under the purpose section of the policy um, and staff are proposing that the award pa uh, review panel, um, which is curr currently comprised of ADP members, be expanded to include uh, one nominated member from the Advisory Planning Commission and one nominated member from the Heritage Commission. Next slide, please. Um, moving forward, the, the Planning uh, Department recommends that the st staff, uh, or, or sorry, that the council approve the Alan Cassidy Recognition of Renovation and Building Achievement Awards policy as presented uh, with the updated um, policy notes. Back to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Muller. Uh, are there questions? Go ahead, Councillor Watson. Thank you, Mayor, and through you to Mr. Mueller. And I know I did ask this in advance, uh, but I just want to ask it in public because it's partly to jog my um, uh, council colleagues' memory. Um, my recollection of our discussion when we sent this back to staff, and there was a very general recommendation in the minutes about uh, expanding the scope of participation. understood that we had also suggested that parks and culture might be included in this process too because the kinds of projects that might come before council might include not just buildings but public spaces and that there was an element there so my my question to staff and maybe also really to to dig into council's memory is if that would would make any sense or was part of our consideration 
So it's sort of a question to staff and council, if that's all right. Sure. I'm not sure how to answer that one, given the, the dual nature of it, Mr. Miller. I'll give you the first cut at it. Um, it was not, uh, thank you, Ms. Mayor, it was not part of the, the f formal motions. Um, if it is something that the council would like to consider, it could be brought forth at this meeting, and we could um, include that in policy revisions, take that back. But um, as part of this policy revision, it was not, uh, it wasn't part of the motion, so therefore not included in, in the, this report. Thank you. I don't really want to create extra work for staff or another round of review, but if anybody at the table wanted to weigh in about that, I'd be happy to hear from them. Let's go ahead, Councillor Smart. Um, it was my recollection that we were going to include a member from Parks and, and Rec, and so I would support that if it was uh, put forward. Thank you. I'm just going to make a note here. If you go back to the 2004 policy, the original makeup included uh, an advisory design panel and a member of the arts community, and then three members at large. So it was actually part of the very, very original when it was first set up, and probably would be in keeping of that. Uh, procedurally, if uh, council wished to add that portion of it, would be to give a, a general, uh, in the recommendations here, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my pieces of this, the approve the Allen Cassidy Awards policy, um, with those with those changes, so that we just look for to have that motion made, and then maybe have an amendment made to uh, to expand it to include the, that piece, if that's the will of council. I'll probably deal with that that discussion that way, so we can do a bit more formally. Are there other questions of Mr. Muller or each other? Since we're doing that as well, I don't see any? Are there many members? Oh, go ahead. Councillor Green, and I'll go to the public if anybody wishes to comment or... Are you questions. taking... Oh, you're taking just questions at the moment? Just questions, and then we'll get to motions. And okay, thank you. There's no, after we get to public input. Are there any members of the public who do wish to address council on this matter? By the way, all these lovely photographs around the... Or the or drawing sketches around the outside are all from the Alan Cassidy Awards uh, uh, previous winner, so they're a pretty integral part of our uh, of our community here. Uh, but I don't see any members of the public jumping or up or either online or in person to uh, to speak, so I'll come back to this table. Uh, Councillor Green, you wanted to... Thank you, um, <clears throat> and I appreciate that, uh, that Councillor Watson raised this uh, issue to include a member of the the Recreation um, Arts and Culture Committee. I, I think the idea or the, the, the spirit behind it was to make sure that this was a broader, more inclusive group and that it would have um, good community representation as well. So I have no objection to including that third, representat third representative um, if that doesn't cause a problem for, for staff. Department moving forward if it doesn't create a, a lot of extra work. Thank you. I think given that they're going to draft the policy based on our direction, that's not a, it's not extra work, it's just if that's the will of the body here. Um, I'm just going to just walk us through the procedurally here then. Can I get a motion to receive the report? Seconded. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on the receipt? Not seeing any, I'll call the question. All those in favour? Any opposed? None opposed? Um, maybe what I'll, yeah, why don't we just, can we just have a mover as it's written here so we're very clear about what we're discussing? I move the staff recommendation, Your Worship. Moved and seconded. Thank you. Um, so this is live. I, I might suggest if there's a will to test whether there's a, an agreement that this motion be amended to uh, also include a member of the Parks, Rex and Culture Committee uh, as, a, as a secondary, as another member. So if, that's, if, if not, if that, that would be the motion I would suggest. I can't make, I'm not going to make the motion. Uh, Councillor Watson. May I make that motion that the uh, staff that, that the uh, recommendation by staff be amended to include, in addition to the um, Heritage Commission and the uh, uh, Advisory Planning Commission, a member of the Art Arts Rec and Culture. Par is it? Par I thought it was Parks and Culture, but maybe it's, Park, it's Park. Parks Rec and Culture yes. Committee. Uh, so that there would be three additional um, our community representatives, and when the awards. I don't want to muddy the uh, the motion. The motion to amend is to include. Uh, after the scope of one member for the Advisory Planning Commission and one member of the Heritage Commission and a member of the Parks and Culture Commission. Thank you very simply. Okay, just add that extra and in there. Second. So, the, second. so the, the motion is now, this is, we're on the motion to amend, to include those. So discussion. All right, I think we're all in agreement on that. Uh, so I'm going to call the question on the amendment. So is this going to add that wording into the main motion? All those in favor? 
Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Um, so we have uh, now the amended motion in front of us. Sorry, I'm, go I'm going a little ahead of you there, Mr. Coates, to, to include the, uh, the things on the screen. That's a fairly straight. Amended motion. Here's any other discussion on that? I just want to express my appreciation or our appreciation for this. That uh, to take that that discussion that that happened in the January meeting, come back here. Uh, I think this uh, sets this uh, this award up in good stead to be a really uh, continue to be such a positive aspect of the uh, of the community and the and the district. And I uh, in, I know uh, Alan Cassidy is no longer with us, but this is a wonderful heritage uh, from his time served on council and his contributions. All right, I'm going to call the question. No, go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Just a, a point uh, here, Mr. Mayor. Advisory Design Panel members, one nominated member from the Advisory Planning Commission, one nominated member from the Heritage Commission. Will it also then be one nominated member from the Parks, Rec, and Culture Committee? Just for consistency. Just. <laughs> Yes, I, I'm just. You're right. That is the wording in the in the policy that's there. But the the wording that's that was provided for us is just to include it so that they were added in. So I'm assuming that the language will be consistent. The motion does not require the specific language, or that concern. All right. No other discussion on the motion. So this is a motion as amended to include the Parks, Rec, and Culture representation. All those in favor? Any opposed? Not opposed. That carries. Thank you. Any other uh, items arising from that? All right, moving on, and moving on to, oh, yeah, that's okay, I think for Mr., oh yes, yes, thanks. Uh, so <laughs> item number 9.2 now, we're moving on to, okay, recreation service level change. Uh, we've been waiting for a while, Mr. <laughs> uh Welcome to the meeting. Uh, I'll just let you do the, uh, the overview here. Uh, and the same process is gonna happen at this one, just for the record, anybody who wishes to, speak to this matter uh, is, uh, we'll, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, we'll have an overview from staff, we'll have a chance for council to ask questions, we'll go to the public for in, any questions or comments, and then we'll come back to this table for uh, for consideration of motions. Uh, so welcome, Mr. Meikle. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and uh, through you to council. So not necessarily a report that uh, we as directors like to bring forward because it, it generally means we're we're not meeting our service levels and haven't been in some ways for for some time so uh, what uh, we're bringing forward here like many industries post pandemic we're uh, suffering with with some staffing challenges and in particular in a couple of areas of of our services primarily the pool to begin with uh, mostly due to the certifications qualifications that are required there for lifeguards so what we're we're seeking here, this it really isn't about uh, you know requesting a new budget or, or this isn't a financial issue in terms of supporting service delivery. It's the the concern is we're, we've not been able to meet services or to meet those service delivery standards, and looking to provide some stability and some consistency for the public in uh, knowing what our schedule will be, and uh, I'll get into some of those those details. So. We've been experiencing uh, pool closures since July of 2022, off and on. Uh, majority, it, it has gotten worse, so to speak, as time has gone on and into the fall. Uh, certainly in September, we were pretty much seven nights a week, not able to stay open until that 12.30 a.m. Uh, time frame that was our standard or uh, uh, previous service level, so to speak. So primarily that's, you know, in the pool, we, it's a, a majority of young folks, uh, older teens, 16 to 22 year olds that are our lifeguards in the pool. Uh, as mentioned in the report, uh, transportation and staff safety concerns are some of the uh, greatest barriers or concerns of staff working after 10 p.m. Uh, our understanding is after 11.30 p.m. There, there are no buses, no transportation easily available for staff without having to walk quite a distance. Um, and uh, we've certainly heard from a few parents who don't particularly enjoy getting up at 12.30 a.m. to come and pick up their sons and daughters. So, um, we're, we're now, part of what prompted this report coming forward is uh, we're now experiencing the same type of staffing challenges in our fitness studio with our fitness studio attendants. 
Uh, we lost, uh, we've lost several of those staff members in December and January who got full-time jobs in their careers of choice. Uh, and we're, we're struggling again to fill those positions and maintain those hours in the weight room. So we're starting to experience that same uh, intermittent early closures in the weight room as well. So I will speak to, you know, uh, some learning in the last eight months of the pool closures. Um, really in, you know, speaking to our, it's, it's a bit tough to tell in terms of participation rates and how that has changed and people do shift their behaviors in terms of what's available as options. Um, in September, so we, summer we tend not to see, you know, a huge amount of nighttime participation and pool is, is less uh, well used in the summer as people have outdoor opportunities to swim. So in September and October, we did receive six formal complaints from patrons about our uh, shortened hours in the pool. Uh, out of those six, two of those uh, we did uh, process refunds of their passes for. Um, the rest did uh, change their schedules and, and adjusted or adapted to the hours we were offering. Uh, in speaking, you know, generally we see in those late night hours from 10 p.m. onwards to 12.30, a uh, real mix of, of population, and I'm speaking particularly to, to the pool right now, um, but it does tend to be a fairly uh, regular group of participants that, that do attend, and uh, in interviewing our lifeguards and our reception staff, uh, we tend to feel about 90% of those folks that had generally been coming to, had been coming to late night hours prior to uh, July 2022 have readjusted their schedules and we still see them around. We know of a, um, three of them that are, have adjusted to come to actually early bird times instead, so they're coming early in the morning uh, to get their exercise. I will clarify too that this really is, uh, this change in hours is focused on what we call our drop-in facilities or, or uh, services that are really bound by, um, you know, people's ability just to drop in as they feel. They don't have to pre-register to come in. Uh, so that's primarily our, our pool and fitness studio. We will still continue to have uh, rentals in our arena and our indoor sports field after 10 p.m. Uh, those user groups uh, are, tend to be, again, regular users, and we have systems in place that are not staff-heavy or staff-reliant uh, for those to carry on uh, past the 10 p.m. time slot. Uh, otherwise, we're, you know, in terms of also kind of a comparison to other facilities in the region, uh, this proposed change, um, although I use that term change lightly because we have been operating with shortened hours in the pool, as mentioned, since Ju July, um, would it kind of brings us in line with uh, similar hours to other recreation centres in, in the region, other municipal recreation centres. Um, we have traditionally had the longest hours of service delivery in the region and uh, even with this change we're still at the top end of that in terms of the hours of service provided to the to the community. So uh, you know also in proposal here we'd look to um, kind of provide hope to provide some consistency some stability to the population to citizens to know that we'll be open those times and they're not having to consistently check schedules to know like can I come this night and what time are they open till those kinds of things uh, we're proposing about a, a, an 18 month period although that certainly is up for discussion uh, but just in terms of timelines of how things flow with our schedules We'd look to come back to Council uh, next May or June 2024, which would line us up for a, a September 2024 20, change in, in hours should we determine we can go either way there. With all hope, uh, we'd be able to staff our, those hours further uh, as things progress. We are continuing to hire uh, and continuing to seek staff. We were just at uh, job fair last week, um, the Black Press job fair at the Armory, looking for staff. So it's. It's not for lack of effort or lack of trying. It's uh, certainly needs have changed out there and people's availability and uh, willingness to work late night hours has, has changed as well since the pandemic. So again, yeah, we're just, uh, you know, this isn't, isn't a, a request for further budget or further financial support to, to support delivery or service delivery levels. Um, this is unfortunately, we, we can't meet those because of staffing challenges and, and just looking to not be on a month to month or even week to week basis in the information we provide to the public. So happy to answer any questions from there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Miko. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Braithwaite. 
Um, thanks so much, and, and thanks, Mr. Mikko. It's, it, it's not easy for you to come and talk to us about this, I know. Um, uh, I, thanks for trying to, to, to meet all of the demands that um, that we have had in the past as far as uh, recreation goes. But uh, I mean, when you look at other organizations like BC Ferries or restaurants, they're in the same boat as we are. Um, so to speak. So, um, but um, and safety is paramount. I think um, when we're looking at, at our staff, especially in that age group. Um, so, did you you mentioned that the indoor soccer field will still be open? So, what about the tennis courts and the skating and the hockey? Um, if you could just touch on that, and then um, obviously with those other areas being shut down, and if only certain areas within the rec center are open, we will be saving money as well, um, not only on salaries, etc. We'll lose a little bit of money on on um, drop-in um, uh, uh, revenue, um, but um, we'll also be saving money on heating and lights, et cetera, et cetera, um, throughout, the, throughout the building, I would imagine. Mr. Meekle? Yeah, thank you, Your Worship, through to Councillor Braithwaite. Uh, yeah, we will still be able to offer the arena services to, at, generally after 10 p.m., it is uh, rental groups, so uh, primarily tends to be private rentals for hockey playing, etc. Uh, so those will be able to continue. We already have systems in place with our maintenance team uh, that allow those to continue. We don't have staff on hand to allow those folks in and out of the building to do that. Same, that'll be the same situation with the indoor sports field. Um, yeah, in general, and just looking at uh, wages uh, savings, we estimate this would could possibly impact our budget to an expenditure savings in the, I think it was fifty five thousand dollar range per year. Yep. I should, sorry, I'll add to um, there won't necessarily be a huge amount of savings in uh, utilities, hydro, etc. As will be uh, what it does provide for our pool, though, as which is an aged. Uh, pool, it's uh, 50 plus years old, uh, some additional maintenance time through the night to allow for some other projects to happen during that time and our staff to get in there and uh, do a few other things. It provides a couple extra hours to do that. So, I was just going to make a comment that I think that our, our, our recreation center is the same age as Crystal Pool, is it not? And when I look at the shape, and so thank you for that maintenance, because when I look at the shape of our facility compared to that, it's, um, it, there's a dramatic difference. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, and just a reminder to the public, they'll have a chance to provide input as well. Uh, just going to go through these questions first, and then we'll go there. Go ahead, Councillor Green. Thank you, Mayor. And through you to Mr. Meekle. Mr. Meekle, thank you for bringing us a, not the, the happiest report in the world, certainly, and, and we appreciate that. My, 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 I just have one question, and that was regarding the time span. If things improved substantially between now and the fall of 2024, would it be possible then to uh, restore service levels sooner than the fall of 2024, or do you need the 18 months to plan and trial and review? Thank you. Mr. Meekle. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, um, and through you to Council. Uh, no, we certainly could look at uh, making changes earlier. I think if um, things should stay, change on the staffing uh, provision side of things that uh, we could either bring something forward a little earlier to council if needs be. Um, just in doing sort of that general research in, in the HR world, it, it appears this is going to be with us for at least another year, so that's why we kind of picked that. Um, 18 months gives us a little bit of time to evaluate where things are at uh, and to give a good sense through a couple of seasons and our primary seasons of fall and winter when the indoor facilities are more heavily heavily used to see how the public shifts or changes their behaviors uh, and to see how that that impacts things go ahead Councilor Green. and just a quick supplementary thank you um, Mr. Meekle is there a public engagement component to this plan so you, you've just mentioned you know, watching how the public uh, public's behavior changes, and and I'm just wondering if there's a mechanism for gaining feedback over the period of this, these changes to inform um, things going forward. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, uh, and through you to Council. Uh, at this point, we haven't. Nothing is formally planned in terms of public engagement. We in in recreation, in particular, we're pretty fortunate in that. Um, our day-to-day -day jobs are very intimately involved with the public. We're in working with the public quite regularly. So even coming to this process, uh, we didn't engage in a formal 
consultation process with the public, partly because there really isn't wasn't an option to give the public to to, to gather feedback on at this point. Um, but we also we did engage in in doing a survey, if you like, and counting heads. Literally, I've got the sheet here of literally counting heads in our spaces over the last couple of months. Uh, and chatting with those individuals that are coming regularly at those late night times uh, to get a sense of what that that looks like, what their behavior habits are, why they might come at those times, if they're able to shift and, and move. Um, so more informal anecdotal kind of conversations with individuals. But yeah, we certainly could look at uh, doing some, uh, gathering some feedback before uh, we bring something back to council. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Councillor Watson. Thank you, uh, Mayor Murdoch, through you to Mr. Meikle. Thank you, uh, Mr. Meikle, for a really excellent report. It was a great piece of analysis and really showed to us the complexity of trying to, to use the existing staffing to provide the, the best level of service that you can. And I know you did answer um, f on some questions prior to the meeting, but I just wanted you to confirm my understanding from what you had provided that no single identifiable demographic group is going to be excluded because of this proposed closure between 10 and 12.30, i.e. there's not a really an identifiable like group of seniors or skateboarders or whatever they are that are specifically uh, likely to be there during those hours. Outside of swimmers as an identifiable demographic, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mr. Meikle? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Through you to Councillor Watson. Um, not uh, to our understanding, uh, we see the bulk of youth, so sort of 15 to 19 or 15 to 21 year olds, uh, tend to come either right after school, 3 to 5 p.m., or between 7 and 9 p.m. Uh, the population or the participants really drop at 10 p.m., so that's why we've picked 10 p.m. Um, in terms of numbers in the building. And an example just in uh, our fitness studio, uh, between 9 and, or sort of between 8 and 10 p.m., we tend to see upwards of 60 people. After 10 p.m., that, that drops by half, and after 11 p.m., it drops by another half. Uh, even after 11.30, we're lucky to see five or six people up in the weight room. Uh, so I wouldn't say that any particular subpopulation or population will be uh, excluded. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're still certainly open for the general population at all of those times. So the one we were uh, also particularly interested in was uh, shift workers. Um, but in those anecdotal conversations, uh, they would adjust their times. We, in fact, those uh, those swimmers I mentioned that started coming early bird times were actually some of them were shift workers that uh, adjusted their time to come and swim. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just uh, for my clarification, I'll go to the see at least one hand up to to, to address us. Is the um, uh, like, are there any mechanisms by which we can? You talked about uh, career fairs of, of adding or, or developing, so lifeguards, lifeguard training, that sort of thing. I know those because was one of the problems here, of course, is that there was no training for during COVID. So, is there any way of, of I guess, pre-investing in some of these skills development to help uh, help meet some of these needs? Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, we actually, uh, I would say, Oak Bay is kind of one of the leaders in, in offering training for uh, lifeguards and uh, we have um, our, a couple of our programming staff, co uh, programming staff for aquatics that are certified instructors in um, uh, water safety instruction and, uh, and through to lifeguarding. Um, sorry, I'm not drawing a blank on some of the names of the certifications along the way there. Um, so we have been offering those quite regularly. We've got another uh, course coming up at spring break here, which is is well attended. I think uh, what we're experiencing is the majority, if not pretty much all, of the participants in those programs, as I say, are, are teenagers, are 16 to 19 years old, uh, and still presents a challenge to be able to work in those late night time frames and then get up and go to school the next morning. Uh, etc. So we're still faced with them, some of that challenge. Now, one of the prospects looking ahead a couple of years is that, you know, a kind of uh, analogy we've talked about is the 
your typical university sports team that sees you know that that bulk of their athlete, athletes move through that four year cycle uh, and when they're seniors they move on and you bring in a new group of freshmen so to speak and they move through that cycle and we kind of feel like we're in that place with our lifeguarding crew we we lost a number of folks through covid that had been our more experienced lifeguards uh, that had been around with us for a long time they you know through covid things were challenging in terms of staffing and uh, they found other jobs or many went back to school so we're sort of in that place of bringing on this new crew and i we anticipate in a couple of years time as that crew ages with us uh, we'll be in a bit of a different situation so perhaps once they graduate high school and move into university themselves we could see some of those crew we hope to keep with us and that's that's been a lot of our focus is on retaining those folks uh, yes go ahead councillor smart uh, thank you through you mayor i just wanted to um find out like just recognizing that this provides a social need as as well at night for those that may not have a safe home environment is 10 o'clock a um absolute sort of time that logistically works with staff schedules or if if council was discussed to discuss a time between 10 and 12 30. i'm just wondering if if there's a compromise um, of when that um, opening time would be or if or if that definitely needed to be 10. Demico? i thank you your worship through you to councillor smart um no, that there certainly could be some adjustments. My confidence in being able to meet the staffing needs past 10 uh, decreases as we go through the each 30 minute interval there. Um, we did look and chose 10 o'clock as that is we have been able to fill those times, although um, through the past eight months, we've actually, there's been a number of evenings where we've closed the pool earlier than that. Uh, so we are still working to fill that gap, although feel more confident with the hiring we did through the fall that we'll be able to meet the 10 p.m. time frame. Uh, and certainly 10 p.m. is a time frame that works uh, for the weight room staff as well. So um, it was really just taking a look at the trends at, at availability of those because they are auxiliary staff that staff those times uh, of what, what's available and what those trends look like. So, so there is options, but whether we can meet those options is to be questioned still. Thank you, Mr. Miko. I don't see other questions from Council, so before I get to any motions or, or discussion, I'll go to the public. I have uh, <coughs> someone online uh, showing on my screen is Elizabeth Hazel or Hazel Noble. If you could just introduce yourself in your municipality of residence, you're welcome to address Council. Great, thank you so much. Um, my name is Elizabeth Noble, <laughs> maiden name Hazel, which is why you have both there. Um, I live uh, in Oak Bay uh, on the end of Haltane near East Down. And um, I've been a, a late night swimmer in Oak Bay for years, even well before I moved to um, Oak Bay because of the late hours. It's something that um, is extremely important to me personally, but I also just thought I would share um, that it's also extremely important to the recovery community. So I've been in recovery from um, alcohol and substance abuse disorders for about seven years now. And um, the pool in Oak Bay has been a huge refuge for people like me who, especially early recovery, weekends um, in particular can be really challenging for, um, you know, social life community is so centered around alcohol um, in general and having a safe sober place to be and socialize was just extremely beneficial for my recovery and it continues to be so for other members of the public who are in recovery and it just may not um, reach your ears because there is a long tradition of anonymity for people who are in recovery and so I just wanted to go on the record and share just how important it is to this community uh, to be able to access um, the pool in the evening. And I understand that this is not just like a cost saving issue. And in fact, I understand there is a worldwide lifeguard shortage. Um, so I appreciate that the intention is to um, return to extended services if possible. And certainly the transportation issue, I, I absolutely understand. But um, I just wanted everyone to, to know just how important it is to me and to our community. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Noble, for contributing to our conversation here. I thought I saw another hand pop up in the prism. Just a, just a thumbs up. Okay. Uh, various 
signals are a little bit different. Anybody else from the public who wish to address council on this item? Give another second here or two. I don't see anybody else, so I will come back to this table then. Uh, so move we have some receipt. So we have a motion to receive the report, moved and seconded. Probably a lot of discussion on the receipt, uh, so I'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed, not opposed? And looking for any other motions? Would you like the motions all put together, uh, the two recommendations? So this is to uh, approve the reduction of service levels and direct staff to report back in June of next year? Yeah. Yes, you can just do them together. I'll move to make that motion. Is there a second? A move and seconded? Yeah, thank you. Uh, discussion? Go ahead, Councillor Patterson, then uh, Appleton. Yes, thank you, Mayor, and I really do appreciate uh, the very thorough report, Mr. Meikle, and I know that this isn't something that you look forward to to, uh, to doing, and I know it will certainly be missed by those members of the community who have um, taken part in this. I'm just wondering about how things of this nature are being communicated out to the public. So is that through Parks and Rec, or is oh, is the district taking more of an initiative to communicate out to the public that um, it really is about filling staff positions, and and not not budget cuts or or anything of that nature, um, trying to save funding, but actually that it it is just the resourcing for this. So, I wonder what the communication is. Mr. Meikle, do you have a specific answer to that question, or will you take that away? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I would, I'll take that away. That's certainly something we can look at in, in the communications. We did post uh, communications in the Recreation Centre last week prior to this report coming to Council uh, and did mention that, or did include in that uh, posting to, to our members, our participants, that uh, this was about staffing challenges. In particular, so we can certainly reinforce those messages, and I uh, can have a chat with uh, communications here at the hall about how we might do that. Thank you. I have uh, Councillor Appleton, Braithwaite, and Smart. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And I just uh, make the comment that uh, I too appreciate Mr. Meikle's analysis here, and this is a well-reasoned argument. I think we we will. Um, Mr. Meikle is in the unenviable position of having to be one of the first, uh, you know, branches of staff that needs to come before council and present the impacts on levels of service brought about by this type of challenge. Uh, it's not going to be the first challenge of this nature. Um, and so in as much as uh, it does not please me, obviously, to have to approve a reduction in hours of service, um, it is indicative of the challenge the district faces overall in terms of staffing and the, the public, further to Councillor Patterson's comment, um, you know, I think that we need to communicate this really well to the public how this is coming about. And, and to be honest, not to sound negative, but they, sh they can expect that this will continue to affect district operations. Um, you know, we see some significant, you know, we're going to see some significant numbers in the upcoming budgeting process. And so um, I just recognize Mr. Meikle for his analysis here. And, and I do appreciate his comments. I think this, I think the public um, should should recognize how significant it is when Mr. Meikle speaks to speaking to users and and coming up with the best solution. You know, I I know that he and his staff group are are there speaking to people one on one to try and evaluate the impact of what they're proposing. So, uh, yeah, this is an important component to communicate to the public as far as the impact of ongoing impacts to service that uh, that current staffing challenges are going to have. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Appleton. I have Councillor Braithwaite, Smart, and then Green. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I would echo what um, Councillor Appleton has said in, in regards to staffing. It's going to—it's affecting us in many different areas, and, and a lot of it is to do with parks, uh, just the parks department itself as well. Um, uh, just um, going on uh, uh, what Miss Noble was talking about about how important the those later hours are for the rec centre, and uh, what Councillor Green had brought up about um, looking at it in a different. Um, looking at it sooner rather than later as far as if the ability to increase the hours might come up. Um, I'm glad that that's there um, because um, for groups like what Ms. Noble is talking about, I think it's so important. So so thank you for, for keeping your eye on that. Thank you, Councillor Braithwaite. I have Councillor Smart and then Councillor Green. Thank you. And I, mean, I echo... Um, <laughs> 
the um, thoroughness and uh, again it, it's a very sound argument but at the same time I I don't feel like I can uh, support it in its current form to report back in June of 2024 and I, and I do hear that there's an option to report earlier and I, I'm sure that Parks is like I'm sure that everything is being done to um, to work to change the situation but when you reduce hours like this um, it's very hard to get them back and having these extended hours I think is so important as a social need for the community um, and I have I did reach out to um, uh, a friend of mine who was a former lifeguard at the pool and did suggest that it's very, very difficult to actually sign up and um, for the lifeguard courses that the availability of those courses are not easy to get. Um, and I wonder if in addition to this motion, if we can, you know, make something more impactful to include um, being proactive to make it a temporary measure um, and not simply accept um, changing the hours um, that we may never get back. Thank you, Councillor Smart. I'm not going to tell anybody what to do if anybody wishes. If you, if the motion as it sits in front of us is as worded as it is. If there's any changes people want to make, that can be done through motion. Um, I, I'm hearing from staff that they'll, they'll they could look at it sooner than, than that date, but that probably if we don't change the motion, it will just be essentially revised in one year and, and brought back to Council for with the update. Um, so I'll just leave it with that. Councillor Green. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Meekle. Oh. Go ahead, Mr. Meekle. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Sorry, just to address uh, through you to Councillor Smarts. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have proposed in the upcoming budget, and I hope I'm not out of line and going there, but uh, is to look at some ways to subsidize uh, access to those uh, certification courses. So uh, to put some money into budget to be able to do that so that we could bring folks on uh, at the sort of lowest level, if you like, the entry level of those certifications and then offer them to apply for some subsidies to take the upper levels of those certifications uh, as they hopefully stay with us for a longer period. So. Thank you, Mr. Meagle, for that proactivity. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Green. Yes, thank you. And I was just going to say the same. That's that's that is proactive. Thank you. Um, like others, I wanted to thank you for your honesty and and sort of blunt assessment of where we're at in terms of Parks and Rec and and the facility itself and the services and programs. Um, and I am completely confident that you will tell us when the time is right to either restore hours or. <clears throat> you know, beef up hiring, whatever that looks like. I don't have any concerns around that issue. And um, I am. I was particularly touched by Ms. Noble's comments, as Councillor Braithwaite mentioned. Um, I think that's a part of the, the facility and the services and programs we provide that people aren't so much aware of that it's a refuge and a respite. And um, that I found that very um, important. And so thank you, Mr. Meekle, and thank you for the connections you make with the public. That obviously has resonated with people like Ms. Noble as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, I have the motion on the floor right now. Um, do you want to go ahead, Councillor Smart? Um, can I move to amend the motion to report back November 2023? You, you can certainly make that motion to amend. Uh, is there a seconder for the motion? Not seconded. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion on the motion that's in front of us? All right. Um, I think I'm just going to call the question then, since we have a motion in front. No further discussion. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed? Oh, sorry, Councillor Smart. Opposed. My apologies. Uh, and uh, we look forward to that uh, report coming back. And good luck with the uh, with the training of uh, new lifeguards and getting that back up to speed. Um, so just to make sure everybody's uh, updated their agenda package because some of these got flipped around in, in order. So we're on to 10.1, which is a development variance permit. Uh, so um, this is one that does not have any public input. Uh, procedurally, for those who are interested, uh, development variance permits are have a, a prescribed requirement. And so uh, they come to us, this body first, if we feel it has merit uh, sufficient to get public input, we then uh, 
the resolution here is to give notification, uh, to send it out for notification as a formal notification process to all of the neighbours to get feedback. So that's what's in front of us, so we're not making any final decisions on this one. There's no public input at this point. Uh, that would come back at the next uh, meeting if that was the direction. So procedurally, since we have a bit of an audience here, I thought I'd just explain that that process. Uh, so. Mr. M uh, no, am I going back to Mr. Bull or should I go straight to, <laughs> straight to Mr. Muller? Thank you, Roshup. I'll, I'll, I'll be uh, fielding this one. Uh, so the District of Oak Bay has received a development variance permit for the provisions of the parking facilities bylaw um, for the, the existing two-family dwelling duplex located at 2542 Bunker Avenue. Um, the applicant has requested that the variance would relax uh, 4.7 of the parking facilities bylaw, which states that half uh, one half of the required parking be located within a uh, dwelling unit. Um, this applicant um, applied for a building permit um, to renovate their existing basement suite and at that time the, the department was made aware that um, they were not in compliance with the parking facilities bylaw. Um, next slide please. Uh, as you can see here it's the, the location is in between um, St. Anne and, and Lubu um, and next slide please. Um, they're looking to the parking facilities by law, as, as I mentioned, states that, um, that you have to have two, uh, two spaces per dwelling unit. This is a two unit duplex, so therefore there's four, four parking spots, and half of those would have to be inside. Currently, all four of the, 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 parking, uh, the cars are parked either on the driveway or on the street. Next slide, please. Um, the intent of the parking facilities requirement um, is the is to screen parking from the, the streetscape and for, for visual appearance sakes, um, the subject property has an existing concrete driveway that uh, the cars will be parked and located situated in the back of the, the home, um, shielded from the street. Uh, the site has a requi um, the required amount of room uh, necessary for parking four cars and, um, and is obstructed from, from Bowker's uh, street, uh, sight line. Um, there's ex existing mature uh, landscaping uh, uh, hedges along the uh, along the edge of the property that screen it from both the neighbors and the street. Next, uh, next slide, please. Um, so the recommendation is to um, to pr uh, to give notice for the proposed variance and consider the the permit for a, at a future meeting. And um, other options are that refer back to staff uh, with direction on the nature of the changes uh, required to achieve the approval. Um, and if you do proceed to move forward with this motion. Um, public uh, notification would be mailed out to everybody within a 50-meter uh, radius, um, and council would be considering this uh, development uh, variance permit at the March 13th meeting. Thank you very much, Mr. Miller. Uh, go ahead, Council Braithwaite. Um, thanks so much, and thanks for um, the presentation, Mr. Miller. Um, a, a question came up for me when I looked at um, the diagram uh, of the placement of the parking stalls. And uh, just out of curiosity, I'm wondering um, if you can tell me uh, what the amount of hard surface is for this property and if it's in the, with that, with, uh, within the allowed um, uh, amount or is, is a variance required for that as well because I know it can't be over a certain percentage. Good, Correct. Mr. Miller. Um, thank you. Uh, correct. Yeah, uh, the I don't have the figure in front of me right now, but the the site was so uh, the zoning check was done, and it, it is in compliance with the the lot area coverage and the as well as the the other zoning requirements for the R five zoning. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. And I think believe the applicant is here as well. If there's any questions to ask, I'm not sure, but possibly maybe not. Uh, go ahead. Is there? Did I see a hand over here? Yes. Go ahead, Councillor Smart. Uh, through you, Mayor, um, just wanted to ask the proposed parking stall closest um, to the building. Typically, you would see a larger parking stall in order for car doors to open closer to the building. Just wondered, is, is there actually room for a parking stall right next to the building? Mr. Miller. Thank you. The parking facilities bylaw um, actually stipulates uh, the size of a stall if it's located adjacent to a building and if it's located to adjacent to two buildings, so in between two buildings. And yes, the, the stalls are, are within compliance and there's a little bit of actually wiggle room there too as well. And um, through you, Mayor, just an extra follow-up question, just not knowing where the rear door is for the house, I assume there's no firefighting access concerns with parking the car there? Um, we've consulted with the fire department and um, they normally for single family homes will park the engine on uh, their fire engine on the street just to keep it out of harm's way as well as um, for the safety of the driver and they run hoses to the back of the property if needed. Okay, thank you. 
Any other questions of staff on this one? By the applicant? I do not see any. I'll um, so move receipt. Second. Move for second. Thank you. Any discussion on a receipt of the report? Seeing any, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. And I'll move the recommendation. Moved and seconded, thank you. Just for the public interest, this is to direct notice to be given. Uh, so go back to the March meeting. Uh, any other discussion on that? Seeing any, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Thank you. I actually had uh, um, some discussion there, but I didn't have time. Well, for my apologies. Uh, by all means, I'm happy to take back the, uh, the vote on that one. We'll just leave the motion live on the floor. I, I, ju I just wanted to comment that while I definitely appreciate the um, greenness of reusing what is there, I, I just don't want this project to become a precedent for putting parking lots in the rear yards of houses as we move forward. Um, I, I don't think it, uh, I think it's a great solution for this particular project, but I just want to note that um, paving over backyards um, for, for parking is not something I'd like to see as a precedent moving forward. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so I'm going to, having rescinded the vote, I'm just going to call the question now, uh, unless there's any other discussion, and I apologize for skipping ahead, <laughs> higher hands, uh, any, nothing else, okay, all those in favour, any opposed, none opposed, that carries, so the notification will go out. Uh, we move on to now 11.1, .1, which is a heritage alteration permit, um, now is Ms. Uh, Mr. Bull, I see your hand up, uh, I'll hand it over to you and you can hand it over to anybody else you see fit. Oh. Lower hand. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm filling in for Ms. McDougall. It's uh, this is the only item tonight on the agenda, and uh, I offer to uh, cover this for her. So um, I'll give you a short introduction. I had some notes on this. Where are they? Um, so the heritage alteration permit in front of you is for uh, 1265 Roslyn Road, and it deals with a living room, fireplace, and chimney replacement. And uh, this work is proposed because the owners uh, hope to improve the livability of the house by, um, for specific, specifically for colder seasons, by providing a, a more effective radiant heat source. Um, so these proposed interior renovations would include removing the existing um, coal burning fireplace, uh, cast iron cover and vents, replacing it with a fireplace insert that is fueled by natural gas. And these works would alter the living room fireplace, which is a protected interior feature under the heritage designation bylaw for this site. Uh, the new insert would be uh, a black cast iron front in a traditional style, and it generally appears to be uh, visually consistent with the existing fireplace. Uh, the surrounding tiles that are already present will not be impacted by these works uh, because the insert is slightly smaller than the existing fireplace. And you can see a uh, impression of this on uh, page 82 and 81 of the agenda. On the exterior then, there's no alterations, but there is an adaptation to the chimney. Uh, the chimney will get a liner and a stainless vent at the top. So that vent is, is a, sm a minor addition, and that is shown on page 84 of the agenda. So, um, in conclusion, while these uh, improvements are functional, um, the design also looks very um, appropriate, so it seems to have minimal impact on the heritage-defining elements of this property. The Heritage Commission also reviewed this application, and they supported uh, the heritage alteration permit. They added a recommendation and a suggestion for the owners to store this original fireplace for potential future reuse in the house. And uh, staff have followed up with the owners, and they have agreed to sort a fireplace as requested by the Heritage Commission. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bull. Um, I'll ask Council if they have any questions on this matter. This is open for public input, so no hands popping up for questions from Council. Is there any members of the public who wish to address Council on this heritage alteration permit for 1265 Roslyn? Again, don't see any public hands popping up in the chambers or, or outside, so I will call the uh, come back to this table then for discussion. Go ahead, Councillor Green. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> um, this house is just up the street from me. I'm aware of this house. It's a beautiful old home, and I'm also aware of the couple that own it. And apparently, they're really tremendous um, heritage buffs, and they do very fine work. And uh, I, I happen to be speaking to one of the heritage commission members I know well the other day and she said that they're really impressed with the level and quality of work that is being done on this home. So um, I fully support the recommendation. Thank you. 
you want to speak to it, we should probably have a motion on the floor. Just move receipt first. No, it's okay. <laughs> move and second it. Any discussion on the receipt? All those in favor? Any opposed, unopposed? Councilor Green, did you want to move the, the recommendation? Thank you, Mayor. Then I'll. Um, and that is. <coughs> To approve the heritage alteration. That the heritage alteration permit HAP 00025 be approved as presented to undertake works to alter features listed in bylaw numbers 4576 at 1265 Ralston Road, etc. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Moving and seconded. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Appleton, you had to? No. Or just moving. Oh, Councillor Watson. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to uh, note that um, I, uh, that I am sure that the owners worked hard to find an insert that would work with that uh, small hearth. I know in our own home, where we've added one, it, they're they're hard to come by, and I think that the so proposed solution um, looks really good, um, given the, the 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 difficulty maybe of finding something to fit in an old home. Councilor Smart. Would this be appropriate time to amend the motion to include the Heritage Commission's um, recommendation for an amended motion? Um, if you wish to amend it, this would be the time to make I, an amendment. I move to amend to in include the motion and that the owner retain and label the existing fireplace cover vents and coil scuttle on site for preservation. Uh, before I get a second or for that, I'm just going to go to staff on that whether it requires a. Cause I don't, motions at this table would be and have to be enforceable by council so i'm trying to get clarity from my mind about what this looks like from a from a <coughs> council motion perspective so i'm just going to find out mr bull um i just want to make sure this this that that i i, I hear the intent is that actually a, a viable motion for us to make at this table um uh, yeah, it depends. I, I think if uh, the goal is to reinforce the, the Heritage Commission's request, that could be through a separate motion. We did consider a staff if, if something like that would be part of the Heritage Alteration Permit. Um, but that permit itself, uh, the conditions of the permit are more about the changes that are going to be made and, it, and the permission for that. And once that is done, then it's complete and the permit process is closed. So it would not be particularly effective there uh, in terms of follow-up. Um, but I think as a, uh, if council wishes to reinforce that request, uh, it, I, I think uh, our suggestion would be to do that through a separate motion in addition to the permit approval. Thank you. Yeah, I think procedurally that would make sense. Uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to muddy the approval of the HAP portion of it. Um, sorry, Heritage Alteration Permit, I shouldn't use acronyms. Um, so I'll just, I'll take that as a motion arising after this motion. So the motion on the floor right now is to approve the Heritage Alteration Permit. Any other discussion on that? Seeing any, I'll call the question then. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed? And I'm just going to ask uh, Mr. Coates, I might turn to you just for uh, appropriate wording on this. Is it to, um, do you have any sense of what would be an appropriate wording to have council request, like to reinforce with, with a request or to ask or, or you know, of the, of the homeowner to, to retain the um, piece, the, the fireplace? Uh, Your Worship, just for some clarification, perhaps. Um, so, just um, I'm wondering if if the intent here is is to request the homeowner to take action. If that's, I'm just not quite clear on exactly what the consideration is, and so I'm struggling to give you some nope. advice in the absence of the context. It's fair, and I'll, I'll go between you and Mr. Bull on this one, and not without to spend too much time on this, but just so the the, the Heritage Committee had made a recommendation and. That they or request that the homeowner keep the actual physical uh, coal burning fireplace, the cast iron, on premises just so they wouldn't get lost. Uh, they've agreed to that, but they, they, they had made a recommendation that we make that motion at the council table. Um, and I'm just very leery about making motions as a legislative body that are not enforceable, essentially. So I just try to think of what that, what the wording would be appropriate. Thank you, Your Worship. And that, that's exactly what my. Uh, oh object was there to, to understand that this is not something that council has authority to regulate rather it's 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 a request made of the homeowner and so i think that the the appropriate wording and i can certainly uh, put that on the screen and play with it a little bit when i'm not talking so much but <laughs> nevertheless um i think to request that the homeowner take that action would be uh, the most appropriate way to make make it clear that council hasn't got regulatory authority over that but rather it's simply an ask so maybe uh, uh, a motion might be appropriate to 
direct staff to notify the homeowner of our our support of their of, or the request that they they, they uh, keep that fireplace as per the uh, the heritage uh, recommendation. I'm trying to give some good wording there, but Mr. Coos, want to just bring something up on screen so we can. I mean, Councillor uh, Smart, you, you did want to continue this. Is that now that you've heard that? Just the lack of enforcement. Did you want to have? I, I just wanted, um, in full communication of the Heritage Commission, wanting that communication um, to be documented. I'm just trying to respect um, their wishes. I don't know that it necessarily has to be a motion at the council table. I just didn't want it to fall between the cracks. I, I do. Be I do believe that the. Um, the owner is is willing and prepared to do this, and so I just wanted to make sure whatever final documentation was sufficient has occurred. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Green. Thank you, and I appreciate Councillor Smart's comments and, and, and the comments of the Heritage Commission. In my experience with Heritage, however, we want the carrots. <laughs> we, we, uh, we, we want the incentives, and so my understanding is this this um, owner or these owners have been incredibly um, cooperative and and honorable around re re respecting the heritage of this home. Um, I think it's I think it could be a statement somewhere, but I, I would not be prepared to support a motion to enforce because we can't. so I, and and I think we want to send the message to them that we really fully appreciate what they're doing. Thanks. Maybe I'll just take this back before we have a motion. If council is amenable, uh, I'd be very happy just to write a letter on behalf of council to the homeowners. It's just essentially expressing our thanks to them for for being willing to do this because that was essentially the piece of it. Is that okay? So with that being said, I think we don't we don't need a motion, Mr. Coates. I think we'll just we'll just we'll just write a letter and do it with this non-legislatively. So okay. So I. If I can just ask staff to remind me, because this, you know, <laughs> tomorrow when this is when this is long exit in my brain to actually do that letter. Um, okay, so uh, we've had the motion. I've called the question on the main motion. We had a motion arising uh, that was rescinded. So we're just essentially done this piece here at, at this point. Is there any other items arising on this matter? I don't see any. Okay, I am now going to move on to the next item on the agenda, the last item on the agenda, which is uh, eleven point one. Uh, sorry, 12.1, uh, which is the uh, Henderson, Bo Henderson Road bike lane parking. Um, and I might just, we had it read into the record thing, but you can, if you want to read it aloud, Councillor Smart, you're more than welcome to do so. And then um, we'll have to see, if, <laughs> see if there's a second, or if there's a second, or then we'll get to, uh, to discussion. Uh, I am, it's sort of these things are always at the call of the chair, but I do intend to allow public input as well. We certainly had lots of public input through the, um, um, through the email process, as you see this large amount of correspondence on this one. Uh, but certainly anybody in the audience or online is more than welcome to address this as well. I would just ask if you've written a letter, don't read it aloud at that point, uh, but uh, we'll get to that when we get to it. So again, same process, we're gonna have a motion. We'll have questions. Um, We'll take public input and then we'll come back to this table for, for consideration. Uh, again, I'm presuming it'll be seconded, but I'll just go with that. Go ahead, Councillor Smart. Yeah, thank you. I move the Council approve in principle the concept of directing staff to bring forward an amendment to traffic control order number 2008 05 that allows cars to park in the Henderson Road bike lanes from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. to indicate no parking at any time, including Saturdays and Sundays. And that should Council approve a revised traffic order by Council, that staff be directed to replace the signage to reflect that no parking is permitted at any time. And that staff be directed to seek input from affected property owners prior to the final consideration of this motion. Thank you, Councillor Smart. Is there a seconder? Second. Moved and seconded. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Smart, I will give you the opportunity to motivate. Thank you. As we look for ways to be impactful, cost effective, and use minimal staff time, I bring forward tonight as a meaningful first step that we can take to make early progress this year with active transportation. I also bring this forward as the community um, wants to have this conversation. Significant changes have occurred in both our local and global community since 2008 when this bylaw was enacted to allow parking in bike lanes. 
The growing awareness of the climate crisis has highlighted a need to change our daily habits with respect to how we as individuals and as a community contribute to carbon emissions, primarily through the burning of fossil fuels. The province's Clean BC Roadmap to 2030 recommends government leadership to encourage mode shifting to more efficient modes of transportation. Recognizing the role that the Capital Regional District plays in achieving a significant and immediate reduction in global greenhouse gas emissions, the CRD has set a regional greenhouse gas reduction target of 61% from 2007 levels to 2038. The same report shows that as of October 2021, comparing Oak Bay's 2007 to 2020 greenhouse gas emission levels, Oak Bay was at a 15.5% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. This leaves us with a further 45.5% reduction to achieve between 2022 and 2038. We have much more work ahead of us to support our community in meeting the CRD's emissions goals. As a municipality, we need to support our community both through leadership and by creating the infrastructure and supports for our residents to make lifestyle changes that utilize less carbon and mitigate the impacts of climate change, such as increased storms, heat domes, and rising sea levels. When I was on the Climate Action Working Group, we heard from experts and studied the CRD statistics and realized that one of the most impactful changes that we could make in our community was to lower our carbon emissions, and it was in the area of transportation. A successful approach being to support our residents in moving away from single car use to lower modes of transportation, such as walking, cycling, and transit. In going door to door in our community, I've heard a strong desire from residents of all ages to drive less, to move from being a multi-car family to a single car family, or in some cases to give up their car altogether. I also heard from some residents that they felt unable to make the transportation mode shift at this time, as they did not feel safe without a cycling network. I heard from parents who wanted their children to travel independently to school in sports activities and clubs on evenings and weekends. However, they did not feel that the roads were safe and therefore primarily drove their children from place to place. I heard from seniors who were unable to walk long distances but were able to cycle or scooter and did not feel supported in having a designated place for bicycles or motorized scooters on the road. And I heard from working families who did not understand why their municipality was not significantly supporting this transportation option that they desired. The last two census reports show that we have between 11 and 12 percent of Oak Bay residents traveling on bicycle as their main mode of commuting to work. There are many more residents who utilize a bicycle for traveling to school, shopping locally and for recreation. As a council, we are currently in the process of exploring how to roll out our active transportation plan. We currently have a precedent for allowing part-time bike lanes in an area of Oak Bay where the average driveway can hold four cars in addition to a garage. I am unaware of any other municipality in BC that has this type of allowance. It will be challenging to move forward with implementing a full-time bike lane network that allows residents to get rid of their cars when we have yet to show the leadership of fully utilizing the bike lanes we currently have in place. We are going to have a much more challenging areas of Oak Bay to implement bike infrastructure where houses have smaller driveways or no driveways at all. How are we going to explain to these residents that we have a special rule for those that live on Henderson Road to have bike lanes only part time? What is the logic based argument for prioritizing the convenience of a few residents who wish to park their cars immediately in front of their home in excess of their driveway and garage capacity versus the greater good of the community having a comprehensive active transportation network? Currently, very few residents park in the bike lanes on Henderson, showing that the impact to residents will be minimal. But when parking in bike lanes does occur, it is very disruptive to cyclists and sometimes pedestrians when the cars park half in the bike lane and half on the sidewalk. When there is an occasional greater use of parking in the bike lanes for events such as parties or on nights and weekends, this is disruptive to the safety of cyclists when they most need the bike lanes and traffic speeds are often too fast to safely share the roads with cars. You've now had the opportunity to read the letter of support from UVic for full-time bike lanes on Henderson Road. Representatives from Camosun College on my recent visit as liaison also expressed how important active transportation is to their school community. The CRD bike counter located at the top of Henderson Road at Ring Road clocks an average of almost 1,000 cyclists a day. These are students, employees, teachers, parents with children in tow, and not all of these users return within the seven to seven Monday to Friday time frame. When their safety is most at risk at night, they need to navigate around parked cars. To date, we've received approximately 45 letters of support and four letters of concern. This motion allows for staff to connect with affected residents to ensure residents have the time to communicate their views and needs to council. They can then have the opportunity to be invited to a future council meeting where a final decision is made regarding the amended bylaw. This motion aligns with our active transportation plan and the official community plan. And this motion supports a vision for a bright future for Oak Bay where we are climate friendly 
and have equitable transportation options for our current residents and for future residents. Thank you, Councillor Smart. Uh, are there any questions? We're really going to just stick with more or less questions at this point before we get to debate. I do want to give the public an opportunity to weigh in before we get to that portion. Go ahead, Councillor Green. Just a question through you, Mayor, to Councillor Smart. <coughs> Excuse me. You referred in the third recommendation um, to property owners, quote unquote, and I'm, I'm concerned that that is exclusive, that there may be um, tenants. Uh, there, there may be um, teenagers between the ages of 16, driving age, and 19, voting age, that also occupy the home. So I, I would prefer a terminology such as resident, but I will, I will leave that with you. Thank you. We can deal with that in the amendment phase, if that's a little counsel. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, is there any, wasn't really a question quite as much as it was the piece, but... No, it's fair. It's fair. I, I very much uh, appreciate that. Thank you for catching it. All right, and uh, any other questions of Councillor Smart on this one? Or staff, frankly, but this has not really had a chance to be reviewed by staff. It's really sitting at this table as a, as a, as a body. Okay, uh, not seeing any, so we are going to open this up to the public if people wish to come forward and address us. Um, I'm take you. Uh, I have actually a registered one, reg one person registered to speak, that's Mr. Taddy. Go ahead, come first, and then uh, we try to encourage people to register. That gives us a chance to kind of help manage our room. Um, but it, you will all have a chance to come forward and, and address council. So welcome, Mr. Taddy. And if you, again, if you could just state your name uh, and municipality, just municipality of residence, for the yes. record. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Tim Taddy, Oak Bay. And I'll try and be very brief. Um, uh, last time I addressed council, I spoke by a minute and a half too much, so I'm not going to do that this time. Um, those presentations that we had earlier were just outstanding, and they tie in with this um, uh, motion, which I, I really appreciate and support. I use the Henderson route uh, by bike regularly, and throughout the year I, I use it. Today, I uh, be in preparation of this meeting, I used the Victoria lanes and uh, went down Selkirk Trestle and whatnot. The snow was falling. and. To answer the question of, of uh, all ages and all uses, I encountered everything from families to a motorized tricycle to regular bikes, electric bikes, and the count at the Selkirk Trestle was around 300 at 10 o'clock this morning. Um, and Henderson Road itself, I really echo what uh, the presenters said. When you're coming from the university, and many people are using the university now, not just students and teachers and whatnot, because it's so accessible by bike and so safe, um, that the traffic on Cedar Hill and zipping through to Henderson does not slow down all that much. And that sweet corner is, is very dangerous. Um, so I really support it. And um, as to the comment that one or two of the letters said that this interrupts the five-year plan that councils embarked on, that it sort of uh, might, uh, might sort of, um, yeah, interrupt it. I say this is such a small step, but effective, cost-effective step, that I really encourage council to move forward as soon as possible with it. And finally, if I just have um, one minute, I'd like to say that um, if you have an opportunity to ride the quick build uh, bike lanes that Saanich has just put in on Mackenzie Road. Uh, they're very cost effective I, uh, uh, and uh, compared to what we see in Victoria, for example. They went up in days and they provide, even with all the gaps for driveways and whatnot, they provide a level of security not only for the cyclists but also for the, the pedestrians on the walkways that did not exist before. Give it a try. It makes a huge difference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Taddy. I have one more person in the room. I see someone online as well who wishes to speak, so we'll just go to the person in the room first. Sure, thank you. Uh, your Worship and uh, members of council, my name is uh, uh, John Luton. I uh, live in uh, the city of uh, Victoria. Uh, the first time I went to uh, Oak Bay Council to uh, lobby uh, for these uh, bike lanes was uh, 1976, and uh, then uh, um, uh, coming up to uh, 2008, I uh, sat down with then Mayor uh, Christopher Coston and uh, Councillor Herbert 
to uh, negotiate uh, the Oak Bay uh, solution. That's as, as far as Oak Bay was prepared to go at the time, and I think we've uh, moved past that, and Oak Bay has e evolved uh, to a point where they can uh, embrace uh, full-time uh, bike lanes. Uh, going back to uh, 1976, when I uh, first brought the issue to council, there were 7,000 students uh, or uh, fewer at UVic, and uh, now there's more than uh, 22,000 uh, plus uh, several thousand uh, staff. So you have a lot of uh, uh, people coming to and from uh, the university and generating a lot of traffic along the corridor, and uh, UVic is one of the uh, biggest, if not the largest, uh, single destination for bicycle traffic um, in the region. And uh, counselors will know, as uh, well as students and uh, uh, staff, uh, that student schedules are not like the workday. Uh, they have uh, social events and a social life uh, that includes the uh, university. Uh, the library closes at 11 p.m., so uh, they're there uh, uh, studying or working in the, in the uh, library. And to uh, Councillor Smart's uh, points about uh, the efforts to shift uh, transportation to sustainable modes, it is very much the case that uh, uh, actual safety and the perception of safety is key to encouraging people to choose uh, cycling for uh, more of their uh, travel needs. The property lines of all of those uh, people that uh, may believe that they're affected by um, the reduction of on-street parking opportunities, uh, those property lines and the, the sidewalk and the roads are public uh, right-of-ways uh, that need to uh, be returned back to uh, public use. Uh, Oak Bay also has a responsibility to the larger uh, community to be part of the solution to uh, lower our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, around the region and uh, uh, make a commitment to uh, growing, not discouraging uh, sustainable uh, transportation. With some 60% of our emissions in the capital region uh, accounted for by automobility, uh, we really need to uh, step up and make sure that um, we're shifting as many of those trips uh, as possible uh, to sustainable uh, modes. So I hope that uh, you will take the opportunity to finish what I started in 1976 and move on this uh, important uh, initiative and uh, uh, return the road to public use and establish uh, finally a uh, full-time um, uh, bike route, uh, or, or sorry, bike lane uh, protocol along uh, the corridor. Uh, thank you very much for your time. <coughs> thank you very much. I have online, uh, I think it's Mr. Leach, with a hand raised, if you could uh, just state your name and municipality of residence for the record. Uh, you're welcome to the meeting. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship and Councillor. It's uh, David Leach. I'm a longtime resident of Oak Bay, and I want to uh, speak uh, in support of this uh, motion. I'll admit I'm uh, biased. I, I work at UVic. I've I've biked up uh, that way for um, uh, over a thousand uh, times, and I'll admit that uh, it's fifty fifty whether I'll do it in the evenings uh, when when those uh, lanes disappear. I'm biased as well because my my son works for uh, uh, Oak Bay Rec up uh, at Henderson. I'm always a little nervous when he's kind of biking up there, coming back in the dark uh, on weekends. And I'm biased because my uh, my wife also works at UVic, uh, but she isn't comfortable um, with the, the kind of lack of infrastructure, cycling infrastructure. So she she tends to walk to uh, campus. And I just I, I think add that it, uh, one that UVic's added. 800 plus uh, kind of uh, beds in residence there. So there's an opportunity and I think a responsibility that that uh, these are um, uh, young people who could be coming into Oak Bay, working in, in the cafes, potentially lifeguards uh, there as well and, and providing kind of a, a safe passage uh, for them. I think it's important as well to kind of realize uh, that uh, whether this lane is safe or not goes beyond kind of traffic statistics and, and to think about people who aren't comfortable uh, yet um, uh, cycling up there because of how the, uh, the cars are sometimes parked and you have to kind of veer into the other 
uh, lane or not. And then one other, I think, important bit of context that has changed since this original decision is just, uh, I think, the e-bike revolution, uh, which has really kind of transformed the the age range of users. I see a lot more kind of families cycling up with cargo bikes, a lot more, well, older people now like myself uh, getting everywhere um, by uh, e-bikes, that e-bikes provide an opportunity to kind of um, get out of cars. And uh, again, I think kind of in, in Mentioning this within our infrastructure is in an important step, and I, I welcome this motion. And I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much, Mr. Leach. Is there anybody else who wishes to address council? Welcome back. Just name and municipality residents again, if you could. Thank you very much. Uh, Corey Berger, I'm a resident of the township of Esquimalt, although for many years I used the uh, Henderson Road bike lanes to travel through UVic, actually, as one of the many people who would have been counted in that counter had it been there, um, on my way to visiting my grandmother who lived in Gordon Head. So it's important to recognize that it's not just uh, people who might be going to UVic. UVic is also a throughput to other places. Uh, in a regional context, uh, Henderson Road is about as busy as any bike lane downtown and about half as busy as our regional trails. So from a regional context in terms of uh, numbers of people already riding on this road, it's kind of number three. So I, I think it's important to recognize that you know this is a there's a bigger picture. I think uh, Councillor Green said it well, talking about broadening it from property owners to residents. I would go one step further. I would broaden the consultation to affected people, uh, residents, people who use the road, people who might want to use that road to bike on. And the second one is a, another minor amendment that I would propose. Was it is there is a second part-time bike lane in Oak Bay, uh, and that was the topic of the second presentation uh, this evening. That is on Cedar Hill Crossroad. Um, so. I, I imagine that it would be amazing to uh, not only remove one, but both of those part-time bike lanes by adding to that that little portion of bike lane on uh, Cadbro Bay Road. So I'm um, hopeful uh, Oak Bay will take this small step forward as you uh, embark this year on that and also your larger regional, uh, your larger active transportation plan. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Berger. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to address council? Don't see it. I'm looking online as well. No hands popping up. If you're in Zoom, you need to use the uh, reactions tab. Or if you're on the 1 800 number, I don't see anybody from the 1 800 number, but uh, a 1 855 number, you can hit star 9 before I close it down. Don't go back and forth, so just checking. Nope. Okay. So I'm going to uh, consider the public input portion of this closed and come back to this table. Um, we have a motion on the floor. Um, and I there was a uh, so, so if, is there any other additional questions that were raised through the piece of this here? Um, I might just, if, might to Councillor Smart uh, flag, there was a, a comment made just at the end there about expanding the consultation to include potential users, et cetera. So um, do you have any sense, because the wording in here is a little unclear to me in terms of what your expectations would be for this, is, uh, it, maybe based on that, if that wording stands, uh, just some sense of that. Yeah, definitely. I, I appreciate um, the ask. Um, my my intention was to keep staff time as minimal as possible with, with showing respect for the history of this situation. And I would definitely be amenable um, to modifying it to from the board's property owners to um, affected residents. Um, I think that uh, I definitely appreciate the comment of expanding it to the whole community. And I think that... Um, we will still continue to um, receive input from the entire community. Um, in in my small discussions with staff to date, I understand that perhaps the easiest thing would be a mail out to um, residents on um, Henderson Road and adjacent side streets, uh, just to ensure that we had um, uh, made them all aware of, of the situation and there wasn't any surprises afterwards. Um, and that then, everybody in the public, including them, could be welcome back to the meeting in which the revised motion is presented. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, any other discussion around the table here? Go ahead, uh, Councillor Green. Remarks are absolutely in order right now. Councillor Green, go ahead. 
Thank you very much. And <clears throat> first of all, let me say I appreciate this motion and, and the intent behind it and the passion behind it because this is a passionate uh, topic. I've consistently supported expanded cycling in Oak Bay and support an active transportation plan that will guide such expansion. The decision before us tonight is challenging because of my inability to fully engage with residents in North Henderson. The lack of a current staff report about collisions and transportation issues in the area and missing information on costs of changes to this route as we begin our budget deliberations later this week. At a special council meeting on February 6, this council completed a three-month deliberation of council's strategic priorities complete with project background documents that define required budgets and staffing. This rigorous process, particularly for staff, produced a systematic, detailed approach to each of the approved priorities. But at no time was the Henderson Road cycling issue raised during the recent election campaign, during our strategic priorities discussion, or as a matter arising from that discussion. I do recall that a master active transportation plan, as well as the results of a recent transportation survey, were considered and unanimously approved. Council agreed that the plan and survey would be significant to informing our decisions on implementing active, multimodal transportation in Oak Bay over the next four years and well beyond. It was encouraging to know that such planning would result in coherent policy and design and involve broad and focused public engagement, as opposed to a patchwork quilt approach for which Oak Bay has taken criticism in recent years. There was also unanimous approval of staff's recommendations for a protocol for future strategic priority setting, implementation, and review, a process designed to ensure that the public is informed and that planning certainty will be achieved when projects are adequately resourced with necessary staff and funding. At the core of this process are what I believe are these guiding principles. That there be no surprises for the public staff or council, and that effective and meaningful public engagement at the front end results in better in man management of public expectations and better achieves public acceptance. I know from experience that council decisions are more informed when we have opportunities beforehand to talk to our community, to each other, and to our staff. Making an important decision like this without these opportunities often reveals unintended consequences later. Um, <clears throat> sorry. What I do know has been raised by residents before, during, and after the election are active transportation issues on the McNeil Corridor, including the McNeil File Bay intersection. Some of us will recall that major concerns from residents and users were formally shared with Council last year. They provided significant anecdotal evidence combined with a staff report that resulted in a compelling argument that fixing McNeil is the logical first step to necessary active transportation improvements for the area. As we know, McNeil is the south marker for the beginning of the south-north Val Bay henderson uvic commuter cycling route, one of the longest major routes in Oak Bay's network of eight. That active transportation users face serious public safety hazard at, at the south end of the route, specifically for cyclists riding from McNeil along Fowl Bay Road to Oak Bay Avenue and further to Fort Street Cabra Bay Road and for pedestrians along the east side of Fowl Bay Road from McNeil to Brighton is clear. This was highlighted again in January of this year when Councillor Smart and I met with a Fowl Bay resident spokesperson who provided us with a tour of the area from McNeil North to Brighton along the east side of the road, asking that the municipality addresses urgent public safety hazards for pedestrians, cyclists, and drivers along that stretch. Compared to the Henderson Road section in question, improvements to McNeil suggest a more compelling case for public safety upgrades, especially now in view of the Richardson Street closure that has resulted in higher volumes of motor vehicle traffic on Fowl Bay Road between Fairfield and Oak Bay Avenue, especially at peak commuting hours, and I know this because I live in the area. The section of Henderson in question is a mostly straight road that appears to have good daylight sight lines, designated cycling lanes during peak commuting hours between 7 and 7, 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., five days a week, and a speed limit of 40 that I understand is patrolled and enforced by Oak Bay Police. There are no major intersections after Lansdowne Road and before Cedar Hill Crossroad. 
worth noting because research suggests that one of the most common collision scenarios is the intersection creating three dangerous hazards, the left hook, the right hook, or the T-bone. As a former motorcyclist, believe me, I am acutely aware of these hazards. We have all expressed a commitment to meaningful and consistent public engagement, but neither residents, neighborhoods, nor the North Bay, Oak Bay, nor the North Oak Bay Community Association has been consulted about the potential implications that this proposal means for neighborhoods, residents, and one of our key values, livability, for homes and families on Henderson Road and for residents on side streets who will now be expected to take overflow parking off Henderson. I'm concerned about a cogent, coherent plan, and I believe that doing it this way, sort of a patchwork or one-off, is, is not the best way to address it. And I appreciate all of the input we've had tonight, particularly from the public. Um, and I will leave those remarks for now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Green. Thank you, Mayor. I also have some prepared remarks that I'd like to uh, read out now. Um, I'm really excited that Councillor Smart has brought this motion before Council, and I will be voting to support it. Adjusting the Henderson bike lanes from a part-time to a full-time active transportation route for cyclists and a wide range of other micro-mobility users is a very low-cost, easy, but high value proposition, which directly supports at least three of our priority areas as a council. At present, Oak Bay has no continuous north-south route through the municipality for cyclists. If we connect this gap along Henderson Road, we will have come one important step closer to addressing that objective in our active transportation plan. Practically speaking, this is a small and easy thing to do Symbolically, however, it will be a huge move forward for Oak Bay. Clearly, given the correspondence we have received on this matter, it is supported by many within Oak Bay and beyond. I wanted to better understand the current situation along this stretch of Henderson Road that's subject to the restricted hours for parking during the day. So I spent some time mapping the route and have included my findings in the correspondence attached to this agenda item. I think at this point it's about page 68 of that package of correspondence if anybody wanted to refer to it. Anyhow, what I observed indicates that most property owners have already adjusted to the reality that they cannot park in front of their homes from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. All 55 properties along this stretch of the route where residents may park, may park between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. and over the weekend have at least two uncovered parking spaces. The average number of on-site uncovered spaces is by my calculation 4.3 spaces per property. This does not include covered parking on these properties. If you add that in, the average goes up to about 5.3 spaces per property. Among many issues raised by those who have written to Mayor and Council on this motion, cyclist safety is a concern repeated in many of the letters. As a cyclist, I share those concerns. From time to time, cycling home down Foul Bay Road from Camosun College, where I work, to South Oak Bay in daylight, I will have to pull out into the traffic to pass a vehicle which is using the bike lane as a loading zone. Frankly, it's terrifying. So imagine what that feels like, repeated perhaps not once, but multiple times on the Henderson Road portion of the same route after dark. What we force cyclists to do along this stretch from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. and on weekends is akin, in my view, to closing the sidewalk along the same stretch and forcing pedestrians to detour into the travel traffic lane in order to make their active transportation journey. We would not permit this for pedestrians, and we should not permit it for cyclists either, who are just as vulnerable in the face of fast, in the face of fast moving vehicular traffic. Our streets have three sets of users, pedestrians, cyclists, and vehicles, and we need to make them a safe and clearly navigable space for all. I do understand that an agreement was made with the Henderson Road residents in 2009 to allow them to park in the bike lane after 7 p.m. However, many things have changed since 2009, and our collective concern about climate change, 
and our desire as a community to support active transportation are aspects of that change. To close, I believe that the higher public good here is the creation of a continuous full-time bike lane on a cr critical north-south route in Greater Victoria. I see this as, a, as our obligation as a member municipality of a regional district which values and promotes safe cycling and which needs our participation to build out the network. Although I realize that making this change will require the residents along this stretch of the bike line to make some adjustments in their behavior, I would encourage them, and I mean this very sincerely, I would encourage them to consider the important contribution that they can make as part of the community to support the greater good for Oak Bay and the region. We can do this Oak Bay, and I believe we should do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Watson. Anybody else? I can go keep going around the table if you want. Oh, go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor, and having listened to the other remarks around the table, I also prepared some remarks, but I'll have to edit them because I don't want to uh, repeat everything that has been said. I, I certainly appreciate um, presentations we've had tonight. I appreciate the intent of this motion before Council. Unfortunately, I don't support the motion in its form at this point in time. Council had an agreed upon process for priorities and I think there was a, a, a solid reason for doing that. Prior Council we had somewhat of the, the same process and that was that we would, um, we, whenever we were looking at uh, ideas, and there was all kinds of ideas that came forward, that we also would keep in mind resources. And we talked about problems with the resources just earlier this evening. And so we determined that in order to be successful in, in moving forward with our priorities, we had to be able to get to feasibility because in previous years, councils had um, commissioned reports, but because they didn't get to feasibility uh, by sustainable funding, the reports then sat on the shelf. Through this council last term, we came to an agreement that for everything that was on our priorities, we would get a project backgrounder so that we would underst understand all of the ramifications of the decisions we were making. And they, the any of those affecting items for a priority would be identified early in the process to A, understand impacts on district resources, both human and financial. Support sustainable funding. I am very much a supporter of active transportation. Active transportation, though, does exceed bicycle lanes. We actually had overwhelming response to our pedestrian survey this past year and many of the residents in the community emphatically told us we had to do something about improving the sidewalks and the, the mobility for those who used the sidewalks and bus transportation. In fact, we heard earlier this evening that in the same area we're talking about having a bicycle path, we have we have a transit shelter where you get off a bus and you don't even have a sidewalk to go to, and yet we haven't dealt with that. So I, I think that active transportation has been round the table supported, and certainly in the last council term was supported through funding far in excess of what any council prior to that had approved. In fact, by using budget surpluses as they become available, we could actually, if the funds are available, allocate up to a million dollars to active transportation in all its forms. So I think the council has a continuing, they demonstrated originally and have a continuing uh, support for active transportation. But as Councillor Green uh, spoke to, the McNeil Corridor, through the voices of our residents, came forward as as uh, a priority issue because of safety 
and use. And in July of 2022, Council directed staff to complete detailed design for traffic calming improvements on McNeil to be completed and constructed as part of our 2023 capital program. So that's already um, in the works. We had a lot of discussion with the community. Meetings were well attended, and we, had a, we received a lot of valuable information. We also, um, staff brought to us uh, traffic control control review report and I would like to see that implemented that came forward also in 2022 prepared by staff who worked with ICBC and transportation consultants they ident identified 520 issues I issues were identified categorized and prioritized so that we can start working on those in our active transportation budget and those also include a number of safety issues so we, we have those important programs to work on. There, another program that was discussed and staff are in discussions with the City of Victoria um, is for the Fort Street bike lane. And so we will see what comes forward out of that. And now, of course, this year we have Accessibility BC um, Act which requires us to have compliance to establish an accessibility committee an accessibility plan and a build tool to receive feedback on accessibility. And I can certainly say that having, having a transit stop where you exit a bus and there's no sidewalk and nowhere to go does, it, it, it's not going to pass that test. So although I, I recognize and I certainly appreciate Councillor Smart bringing this forward to us, there are a number of projects that are in play right now that uh, we will see when we come forward to our capital plan, but I'm also aware of the need for sustainable funding. And right now, as I look at the preliminary um, financial plan before us, the projection right now is 11.6% tax increase versus um, what we had anticipated the year prior to, a 4.63%. So right now, as, as I look at the, the budget that we will be considering, the priorities that we, and the process for priorities that we all agreed upon, the work that we have on active transportation that we hope to complete in 2023 to 2024, um, and the limited resources right now that we have on staff, I think that um, while it's, it's a, an admiral goal to have the uh, extension of the bicycle path um, on Henderson, I think that right now I can't support it in its form of, of focusing on the, on the bicycle lanes without directing the attention to all of these, the other priorities that we have to deal with. So I won't support this motion at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. I'm going to let first time speakers go and then I see a second time speaker. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak before I go to second time speakers? Councillor Appleton. <coughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I don't have any prepared remarks because in some cases both things can be true. Um, in this particular situation, uh, I have concerns and the concerns that arise for me come from um, the interest in implementing the active transportation in a comprehensive and holistic way. Um, we've had discussion already tonight and heard from our guests about the significance of building out the active transportation uh, network in its entirety. Uh, and the network, um, as has been mentioned, and, and I tend to concur, the network as laid out in the 2011 active transportation uh, strategy essentially remains viable. Um, and council has heard me advocate heavily for active transportation over my time on council. Um, and I want to see us keep our eyes on that target of creating that minimum network of active transportation corridors this term. 
um, it will not be, uh, it will be a significant resource investment. It will be challenging to implement, uh, but it is something that, in my view, that we must do at this stage of the game. Um, <clears throat> that said, um, the 2011, as has been mentioned in, 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 on a number of different occasions and in some of the correspondence, the removal of the access restriction, the removal of the parking in the Henderson bike lane was itself a recommendation in the 2011 Active Transportation Plan. Um, and I regularly hear from, because I li like to talk about the topic and I, and I discuss the topic with, with uh, residents on a regular basis, I still regularly hear from residents who recognize that that was a recommendation that was not followed up on and still uh, are, are irritated and frustrated that that was not followed up on. So I guess what I would say is, is that when I, when I take everything on balance, we have a lane here which is, which is probably overdue for revisiting. The standard in terms of the temporal restriction is uh, out of line with uh, basically anywhere else in the region. Uh, that, that type of temporal restriction just really doesn't exist anywhere else. And so in and of itself proposes a little bit of a barrier. Uh, I think at this stage of the game, uh, given my affinity and my interest in moving forward the active transportation strategy, um, and in as much as I understand that that council has signaled their interest and signaled their support in broad terms for the active transportation strategy, this particular motion gives us an opportunity to move the ball down the field a certain extent. Um, so even though I have some significant reservations with respect to detracting from the implementation of the active transportation strategy as a whole, uh, in this particular case, I'm willing to support the motion because I want council or I would like to see council and I would like to see the district indicate that there is an interest in actually taking substantive concrete action on the ground and actually make, moving that ball down the field. and and. To that end, I would actually make a recommendation, or I would like to see us in our conversations about the active transportation strategy, um, move to a position where we're actually talking about physically protecting this lane. So if this lane is, is, is going to be in that location, and if this goes ahead, I would like to see us consider uh, a quick intervention so that we can actually physically separate that lane. We need to look at uh, a viable option and a, and a protected option for a north-south corridor in that portion of Oak Bay. So I, I hear my colleagues' comments on this one. Um, I, I, I encourage both council and the community as a whole, if I can in, in, encourage action, to let's keep our eyes on the prize, keep our eyes on the goal of the larger implementation of the active transportation framework. This should not detract from that. Uh, but let's look at this as something concrete that we can do in the short term. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, Councillor Appleton. Um, I'm just going to ask that we extend the meeting to 8.30 so we can just complete this discussion. Uh, just by Councillor Green. Uh, sorry, 9.30, yes. Extend it backwards, that doesn't really work. Extend it to 9.30. Uh, is there a seconder? This has to be unanimous, I believe, under procedures by law. Is that correct? Uh, move it forward, yeah. So just, go ahead. So it's an extra half hour, uh, so we'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed, that carries. Um, Councillor Braithwaite, do you wish to speak oh thank you mayor um boy this is a real struggle for me because um in listening to i don't have prepared comments so i've been writing madly um in listening to everybody's comments it's it's clear to see that uh, this council is very much um in favor of active transportation we're very much in favor of moving forward with things for active transportation i feel like we're stuck in a, between a rock and a hard place with this because it's almost like we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't. If we don't move forward with this, then we're going to have a lot of people that are angry with us. And if we do move forward with this, we're going to have people not only in that, that neighborhood angry with us, but people within the wider community who are going to say something like, I thought that you were going to be concentrating on McNeil, or I thought you were going to be concentrating on, on this area or something like that. So, so I'm really struggling with this. Um, I think that um, from what I hear, you know, in, in 
in what we what's been brought forward people are saying it's an easy fix it's an easy fix you only have to do this or this well i've already heard two extra things of scope here i've heard one speaker say why don't we include cedar hill crossroad in that and i've just heard councillor appleton say um, as part of the act of transportation moving forward let's try and separate and put it put a barrier there so it's a safer bike lane both great ideas but again the scope that gets added in um, is is a lot I think um, I think we do have to keep the eyes on the prize as you said and and I appreciate the fact that Councillor Appleton over the over last term and into this term has been a huge advocate on the act of transportation and and if, if not for him we would not be in the position that we're in right now that we approved that master act of act of transportation plan moving forward so Kudos to you, Councillor Appleton. I appreciate that a lot um, because it's important. It is where our residents want to, us to end up being. However, I do also um, listen to the comments of, of Councillor Patterson and Councillor Green in that the active transportation plan has been put forward. It was discussed in our strategic priorities. At that time, had Henderson been added in there, then we could. Then I think it would have been easier to talk about now, and it would have been something that would have been included. Um, you know, we have a, we had a, a unanimous agreement to move ahead with that active transportation plan at that time, and so this it kind of came out of the blue. And and again, some people are going to say it's a very easy fix. I say it could very well be a very easy fix. And is it something that? Uh, that we should be getting to eventually, I, I think it is. I think eventually that is exactly what will happen to Henderson. But I think that what we need to do is we need to stick to the process that we had in place and that we need to move forward with the plans that we had for the active trans the master of the master active tra transportation plan um, th over the next year or so what we're going to look at in the McNeil corridor that's a huge thing I had a meeting with somebody the other day on um, Monterey who is looking at the, um, the the number of cars that go speeding past the library on Monterey where there are children on their way to school to and from school that there should be something done there as well. That needs to be part of our active transportation plan. That to me, you know, to look at something like that rather than looking at Henderson where, in my humble opinion, it is a very wide corridor that at this moment in time is safe and could continue to be safe for travel for the next year or so until we get everything else set in place um, for, for the work that we want to do on the Master Active Transportation Plan. So I, I struggle with this, I honestly do, because again, in my head I can see that this is something that needs to be done for the future, but I want to follow the process that we have set in place and keep, as you've said, Councillor Appleton, my eyes on the prize. And that to me is, is what's really important. So. I, I feel terrible, but I think I'm going to have to vote against the motion because I want to keep that the other um, the other things in in mind um, moving forward and the other things that we've already agreed to. So, so yeah, sorry, I rambled a bit, but no 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 prepared notes. Sorry. <laughs> Rambling is technically allowed. Well, I wanted to keep an open mind. So there you go. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll go, go ahead back to you, Councillor Smart, before I, I'm happy to chime in here as well. Go ahead. Um, thanks. I do appreciate it. Um, and I definitely will give you time to, to talk. I, um, I really appreciate everybody's comments. And um, I just want, I guess, to give you my perspective as, as a new councillor. I heard requests for this particular issue um, before I got elected at the doorstep on the election campaign. I heard it afterwards. I heard it when I emailed out and said, have we forgotten anything on our priority projects? Um, and my understanding as a new councillor is that this is absolutely not a council priority project. Uh, I checked in with staff and the scope of staff time and cost on this and the definition of, of, it, of what it would undertake. It needs council approval for the bylaw, but the scope of the project um, can very quickly become operational. So this is absolutely not a case of putting 
behind any other active transportation project. This will take so little time and so little money that it's it's a win-win. It's not a this or that. Um, and what I hear on the table is a full support for active transportation and merely a little bit of disgruntledness at, at procedures from perhaps a new keen councillor coming in that was elected upon the can't we do things at a faster pace and stop with the analysis paralysis. And I I just I want you to really think about all of the people who every single day deal with this and what the greater public good is and to ple please not vote on this based on a little bit of frustration around procedures and please vote on this based on your beliefs on active transportation and could we ask um, Mr. Coates just to briefly touch on his very very initial thoughts on um, staff uh, time and cost uh, excuse me point of order Go ahead. Thank you. Um, Councillor Smart, I am not disgruntled. <laughs> and I am not, seriously, I am not disgruntled and I, I, I acknowledge your passion and your commitment. And this was not a trivial decision-making process for me. I prepared remarks tonight because I've thought about this all weekend. I've had calls, I've talked to residents, and this is not a trivial matter. Um, I can just of you. You can just direct your comments to me. Well, I whatever. Think the point of order. I think I can just basically say it. It's, it's easy to kind of make th these things come across as, as personal. I just want, I appreciate you making the point of order. I'll just acknowledge thank you. it. That, that's thank you. Piece. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, to the question, Mr. Coates, to you. I don't. I, I don't. I, I appreciate this has not gone to staff for for evaluation. So feel free to answer whatever way you can on this. Uh, Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, through you to members of council. So um, I think the reason, whoops, my mic is turned off. The reason I'm chiming in is because for the last couple of weeks I was your acting CAO, so I've been, sort of been part of the continuum of this conversation. So um, I think that's why I was sort of point on that in relation to the sort of the background pieces. So so there's some there's some key ingredients to this uh, proposed motion. One of them is is uh, engagement with the community, and so for it can be broad in scope and uh, I think the notion as the motion is framed is it was uh, some correspondence with with the folks that are living along Henderson uh, was the context that I was familiar with uh, around that to to let them know that this um, potential change was was happening so that's really small in scope and I wouldn't be able to quantify it in dollars but it's it's essentially a bunch of letters that would be a, it would be a, a a letter that would be drafted, not unlike notification for a, a zoning bylaw change or a development variance permit or something like that. So it's that's in and of itself is not a lot of work. And so currently there's signs on that um, uh, roadway that indicate the no parking restrictions between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. And I understand there's somewhere around 25 of those um, that would have to be uh, attended to so uh, and I think Mr. Robertson was indicating that it's not just the removal of them but it's the replacement of them with something else so um, I don't think that's been costed out literally uh, and certainly that's not staff's role in the in the in the circumstance of a council a member motion like this however uh, you know I think it's fair to say that the costs aren't excessive but I think that's a, a, a matter of opinion on on what would it what would be de determined to be excessive. So I, I don't know that any of us would be in a position to really quantify what that would mean. And it's one of these things, I think, as the conversations took place that staff had over the course of about a half an hour in a couple of intervals that, um, you know, it sort of got a little bit bigger than it started out at, but it's still not not excessive. And, and I, I don't think I'd, or Mr. Robertson would be comfortable coming forward to council with any kind of cost around that. But if you can imagine a uh, hundred letters that would be going out and, and the replacement of upwards of 50 signs, that's that's the, the, the financial component of that. Thank you, Mr. Coates. Uh, I'm going to just make a couple comments here and I'm going to go back around for more discussion because I think, it's, I always find bike lanes fascinating because they seem to be very divisive <laughs> uh, far more often than they, they need to be. Um, and you know it's interesting. I think one of the the hallmarks of that sort of strange the this, this strange situation we're in right now is was a result of trying you know, finding a non-confrontational way of getting an outcome, and and there's no reason that can't change on on Henderson. Um, and the the sort of the A B uh, black white yes no kind of piece of this um, I think is is part of the problem is that we have both competing super valid arguments. It's it's low cost and easy. Um, there's a very valid process of, of that we've agreed to that 
would uh, seek proper public consultation and, 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 and staff input into our decision making. Both are totally valid, both have merit, um, and I think at some point this is largely a sort of a governance type of piece whether or not we're going to go down uh, the path where we sort of laid out which is the priorities of this and this would be one of the projects or do we say this is slow enough hanging fruit that it's worth just plucking it off and, and, and running with that on its own. Um, and the reality is that either way we do this, I, I tend to be guided a large part by trying to find ways that the council can be build trust with the community and part of that is meaningful consultation. So I always have a problem when we approve things in principle and then go ask people for advice whether we, uh, if we've already sort of agreed to that. Um, if it's just notification, that's a different question. Um, but it's not incorrect thing to do as long as we're open and above board that that's the, that's the decision making criteria. Um, I have a hard time with it because I think that um, you know, we could easily essentially refer this back to the, into that, into their priority and say that, you know, we, we do think this is actually something that could be managed quite straightforward and maybe even include separations, which is not so straightforward because then you deal with the buses and all the other pieces that have to be dealt with on those stops um, and, can, and can include a consultation. But that's, you know, I, so that's probably my, my, my preferred mode is to go through the process that we have. Um, so I'm, I'm listening to this conversation very carefully because it's got validity on both sides of that. I think the, um, you know, I think the timing of this is partially awkward because we've just finished priorities and we're just going into budget in three days time and so we're sort of in the middle of this, this conversation that we, we actually start allocating resources to these things and that's really where the rubber hits the road and as Councillor Patterson pointed out there's a, there's a lot of pressures on our, our time and cost and so forth and maybe in the context of that we would say, oh, you know what, let's just do something cheap and cheerful because that's better and maybe we say it, no, we can go for grants and make this a, a proper separated model of, 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 of transportation. Um, so just, you know, I'm going to reiterate, I mean, I think that process that we follow is incredibly valuable to bringing the community along with us and preventing the division. I, I, not to say that this isn't worthy of considering, but, you know, making sure that we as a governance board identify the problem, not necessarily the solution, you know, have staff input, have public input, have committee input to those pieces and, and bring back the options to us and make that decision at a governance level where we're held accountable, we all have the same information, uh, we have that both professional and, and public piece of it. I hold that very high. I think that's an incredibly important part of our decision making process. Um, it can get in the way of speedy decision making. And so this is, to my mind, I've struggled with this one because I don't want, I think you can very quickly go from being efficient to being inefficient if the public doesn't see that you're, doesn't see the transparent process and, doesn't, and this is not a good example of one because I think it's a, it's a little bit later than, than many of the things we deal with but just overall if the public stops trusting us or seeing that we're doing things in a transparent basis that's when things really bog down because that's when <laughs> people come up in the hundreds and start you know and not believing that we're actually following that process so I hold it to very high standards um, and I think it's important. This one is a difficult one for me because I think that it's very close to something that that is something that we probably could just make a decision on and move it forward. I also think that there's probably a better design than just doing this if that we were actually going to do it right and probably for a reasonably small amount of cost and we could probably do that within our our project in a way that would um, bring the community along with us. So these are kind of the thoughts that are going through my head. I, 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 I struggle with it. I, I would probably have preferred this come back into the priorities and, and consider it as a as one of the two top priorities with McNeil to, to actually implement. Um, so I, I think if it doesn't go forward today, I would certainly ask that we could bring it back in that process and, and have some staff input in terms of what it would look like. But I hear the conversation around the table. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly where it's going to land. But I thought I'd just share from my perspective where I sort of see the pros and cons, um, and I see there being both. I, what I don't want to see this is sort of go off into some limbo land for another extended period of time. I think it actually has merit. I just, I. I also have faith in the fact that because we've been very diligent about making priorities, funding those priorities, and completing those priorities, that we have the capacity of doing that in this case as well. So I don't think it's a, it should, you know, not be lost, whatever happens at this table. So anyway, those are my thoughts. Um, thank you very much for listening to my rambling, and uh, go back to the rest of the table here. We have a motion on the table to, to consider. We can deal with the motion, and we can go ahead, Councillor Watson.
Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, uh, I just wanted to um, express my own sense when I saw this motion that I did not see it in the same order of magnitude as a priority that required a project backgrounder. And I, and I do want to respect that process. And I have spoken to that very fact when other things have come before us that I thought detracted from that process. So I was in supporting this, I am not trying to undermine what I saw, what I see as and acknowledge as the discipline we're trying to impose on our own decision making. But I saw this as such a small thing for such a big win that I saw it really as operational as perhaps somebody submitting a request for um, a, a pothole fix or a, a, a minor safety thing. I did not see this as a big investment of staff time. Now, I, I acknowledge that Mr. Coates and, and uh, Mr. Robertson, of course, can't be put on the spot to cost this out. But when I hear replacing signs and providing some letters of um, information and invitation to the residents, I don't see it in my mind as anything close to the number of items that we've got on our, on our priority projects for, for the next period. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Patterson for the second time and then back to you, Councillor Smart. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I, th it, this really is a difficult project because I think around the table, um, this council does support active transportation, but all forms. And we have for quite some period of time, ta active transportation was mainly bike lanes. All the conversation was about bike lanes. It's only recently that we could, we completed the pedestrian survey. We had a lot of response for that. So, you know, I think that, and, and we now have legislation before us that, as Mr. Coates instructed us, the Accessibility BC Act um, we, we have to do some things by September. We have a September date of this. But it, it is a reminder that it's active transportation. It is not simply um, bike lanes or sidewalks or public transit. It's a combination of all of those. And I don't, I don't know how you just quickly roll out this, this piece for the bike lanes without also considering the um, pedestrians who have to cross a road, sometimes um, dodging both cars and bicycles to get to the other side because there's not a lot of, uh, of points of pedestrian crossing. And the pu public transit stops are are really not adequate either. And certainly, one of those public transport transportation start, uh, stops is within our jurisdiction. So, I don't know how you. I, I can understand that it seems like a very um, uh, quick solution, easily achievable, perhaps not a high price tag, but only if you push aside all of those other aspects that are important to other members of the community. And we also right now are in the midst of doing the, um, the housing infill plan, and this action will immediately alter that strip of of residential and, and how we might deal with that in the future. So it, it's one thing that triggers another, and I think, Mary, you have alluded to it. it. It's difficult because it seems like you can achieve something in very short order, but there's a lot of other pieces that, that go along with it. And if you're just looking in isolation at the bicycle lanes, then that might be fine. But if you look at um, the Accessibility Act that we are we need to uh, start to have discussion on. When you look at um, public transit stops that also get a lot of usage, especially at peak times of travel back and forth to university, and often do not have very adequate um, room for people to stand and wait. Uh, so there's a number of issues, and so I. I don't see it as 
we can do this as a quick fix and it won't take much time and it won't have a uh, great impact. It just seems that all of the projects that are coming in are much higher cost than anticipated. We know our resources are limited on staff and um, I, you know, I think that this will come, but I just see the priority as being the McNeil Corridor simply because it, we had such high public input into safety issues on that corridor, and it's already in process. The um, Traffic Control Review Report, 520 issues, that were so many of those safety issues that we we also want to act on. So I think there's just a lot on the plate, and there's no shortage of good ideas either from our community or around the council table, and I, I appreciate them all, and it would be wonderful if if we had the resources, both financially and by a staff, to achieve those. But unfortunately, we are, as a council, having to face the tough decision of, of what what makes it in and you know what gets cut this time and maybe comes forward a, a year down the road so um you know i i appreciate the the spirit in which this came forward certainly um but i i just can't support it with everything else that we have in the context of priorities thank you i'm just going to encourage us to uh focus on any new thoughts that people come to mind and uh, not to reiterate points already made because we're down to the crunch time here. Um, so we're going to go back to Councillor Smart. Go ahead. I just need to point out the huge cost of waiting. It's so easy to come up with all the reasons why we shouldn't do something, but the community is exasperated at the pace in which active transportation is being implemented. They have lost faith. This transportation plan is from 2011. We need to show some con concrete, impactful commitment uh, to doing something this year and not have another year go by without a change to benefiting the active transportation in Oak Bay. And as much as we're working on McNeil, it is a much more costly and complicated project. I'm gonna just gonna leave you with a statistic of from um, uh, Sarah Webb from Transportation of City of Victoria wrote in today with an excellent document on just the perceived safety and the mode shift and what we could be doing for our residents this year. Um, so, so the survey that you have in your inbox talks about what is the perception of safety if there is bike lanes versus not bike lanes, which is this essentially what we're talking about here. And 35% um, uh, of survey respondents said they are more likely to cycle if there is more infrastructure. And their 20% um, uh, felt safe when there's no painted bike lane and 53% felt safe cycling with a painted bike lane. This decision, if we go ahead with it, will make a difference to our community this year. Thank you, Councillor Smart. Go ahead, Councillor Appleton. Thank you, Your Worship, and I'll keep it brief. I, I do appreciate the comments um, that my colleagues have made about how such a motion would normally enter into the priority setting for Council, and I, and I do appreciate your comments, Your Worship, about sort of co combining you know, what may be constituted as a, a low-hanging fruit or an easily accessible project and what should be referred forward into the strategic planning. So I think both of those things are valid comments. I think that, I guess, from my perspective, and I would maybe ask Council to reflect on, is, is that we have been assiduous in ensuring that, you know, large-scale projects have entered into the strategic planning process, planning assessing the 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 uh, impacts of those projects and then funding them appropriately and I think council has has done that and I think that that's good practice I think that that doesn't detract from the ability of a council to leave them so I think it also represents good governance to be nimble and to uh, act on opportunities when they present themselves um, when they're done in a reasoned fashion with respect to resources and potential impact so I think that there is still the ability for the council to respect the ongoing process of entering things into the strategic planning process and to, into the process that we've followed for a number of years now, um, while still remaining live to potential opportunities and being responsive to the community through timely uh, governance decisions. Uh, th those there should there is still place for those things. So. Um, I can I can respect the comments about making sure that things enter into the strategic planning process. 
Um, I don't. I think that it also represents good governance to uh, act uh, in a timely fashion in response to uh, desires of the community, where we can where we can feel comfortable with those decisions. So, thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Appleton. Is there any other discussion on this matter? Um, I, I just want to express my appreciation for all the conversation that's happened around this table. It's it's. Uh, so it's interesting. Bike lanes are always into gender, interesting conversations on these things. I um, I think, and part of this is, of course, uh, the public consultation that went on in 2008 was sort of seen to be a, a high point of, of public consultation. And so I think there's always that sort of weight of, uh, is this is this sufficiently adequate to, to overturn that, con that process? And that's kind of where I'm kind of struggling a little bit is I, I'm actually yeah, is that's that's the hard one to kind of just make a decision at a governance level without staff input, without even having proper consultation. Um, at the same time, I really do want to see this look move forward uh, in a more timely fashion. So I'm, I'm I'm still struggling on this one a little bit. So, but I'll have to make a vote. So we'll go with there. Go ahead, Councillor Green, before I yeah, I'll, vote. Uh, I will be brief, and I thank everybody for their comments. Um, what I want to say about process is the reason I'm concerned about process or lack thereof is that if we don't budget and, and, and resource this project, and, and I agree it's important, I agree that part of the reason the community is frustrated with this issue is that we raised expectations in 2008, we raised expectations in 2011, again in 2014. I don't want us to raise expectations again on this issue now without knowing that we have the staff and the resources financially to make this happen. And so that's my concern and that's why we have the process that we adopted to ensure that everything is resourced appropriately because we want to deliver on this and other projects in, in active transportation. We also want to, and I agree with Councillor Appleton, this is a holistic approach. We now have another issue at the Cedar Hill Crossroad. Um, intersections. So when we're planning this, should we be planning for that mitigation as well? So there there are a number of issues at play, but my, my concern about process is that we actually do it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Green. Yeah, just looking around, make sure everybody has a chance to go. Yeah, one last time, Councillor Smart. I guess just one, I'd be very concerned if we don't have enough staff money to take down 25 signs. Thank you, Councillor Smart. Um, all right, so the motion is as it's made on here. There's been no amendments made, so we're just going to call the question on this. So uh, all those in favour and those opposed are going to have to be the deciding factor here. I am going to oppose this, um, but I am going to make a recommendation that we refer this to the strategic priorities and, and see if there is a ma means of, of expediting this with a bit more fulsome public consultation um, for the next, uh, you know, in the short term. I would like someone to make the motion. I will make that motion. Second. Moving second. So moving this whole motion uh, as it is to the priorities piece and uh, for for priorities within that the multiple piece, the the prior the this term active transportation plan. Any discussion on that? Okay, I'm gonna call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? Councillor Appleton, Watson and you know, uh, Sorry, Councilor Smart, did you oppose? Okay, that doesn't go. That that still carries, so that will get that will go forward. Uh, any other items arising out of this that people want to see? Not seeing any. I will then look for. Oh, well, we have any new business on the agenda? And then uh, we'll move the adjourn. adjournment. Move and second. All those in favor? Any opposed? Not opposed. 